In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the event will begin in 10 minutes. I don't know. We'll find out here. Where is it? Uh, they got the bagels back there. 
here. Um, they got an open one. It looks like cinnamon with a little icing on it. Here. That's the cinnamon, and this is the blueberry muffin. Okay. So, The event will beginning beginning in five minutes. Everyone is still gathering. Welcome to the Pastor Fist Broken event. Very good. Okay. Fisk. Here's your password, man. It's a long password. Which one should I dig into? That one, AR6. Which AR6? Yep. And then there's the password for you, and it's long. Yay, 7, A, 6, 989. Just make sure you're up and running and make sure we're good. I just need my nose to update. People are still gathering. The event will begin in just about five minutes. Well, there's, but there's a lot of people. 
I want to show you something. You get a tight spot like that, the arm and the
Good morning. Praise the name of our crucified risen main Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If I could have everyone to kind of make their way from the breakfast table area to your seats, we will begin. The Reverend Jonathan Fiskevet, we welcome you, my mother in Christ, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glad to have you here. I'm not going to give any lofty speeches or lengthy anything. But for those of you who don't know me, I am Pastor Phil Peck. I'm privileged and blessed to be able to serve the good people here at Salem Lutheran Church. I'm the pastor here. And you know our favorite YouTube addiction, Jonathan Fisk, the author of the book Broken. And so without further ado, I turn it Thank you. Um, I appreciate the applause on it. Um, it, is, uh, it is an honor to be here um, and to see this. I'm just going to keep going. To see this large crowd, um, I've been really blessed to be able to see. Hey, Aaron. Aaron, uh, that's the feedback. Can you hear the feedback? I've thought it wrong, but it's not feedback. Test, test. It's really kind of hard to hear that. That's what I'm about. Yeah, I can hear that. Right there. Test. We're going? There we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. So I've been I've been really blessed to be asked to speak a lot in the last year and a half since Lord Gabriel last year took off, but I have not seen a crowd this size. Um, and so this is really really just kind of cool. I feel very honored that you all uh, came out today. Um, I have a question, and this this might seem semi self serving at the start, but it's not. It really has to do with what direction we're going to take the talk today. Um, and that question is, how many of you actually have have read Broken already? Less than that. Okay, that's good to know. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what you can find in Broken, for those of you that haven't found it, and hopefully for the rest of you, this won't be too much of a reaction, but a little bit of a review. Um, if you had all read it entirely, we may go a different direction. Um, the goal of, uh, uh, of Christianity is something that in our world today, well, that's always the case, but especially in our world today, is, is under attack. Uh, ever since the fall, when the devil tempted our father, Adam, and his wife, Eve, uh, to rebel against our maker, uh, he has had one single plan. That plan is to replace God with himself. And he does that by attacking the way in which God tries to mediate between himself and us, and it's the way God wants to have a relationship with us. American Christianity is full of the language of relationship. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Uh, and unfortunately, often what they mean by that is something very different than what God is talking about. God does want a relationship with you. Uh, he intends to relate to you as creator, to creature, even as three persons, particularly the person of the Son, uh, to you as an individual person who he has made. Uh, unique and yet not alone, uh, different and yet not unequal uh, to the other creatures he has made. The way in which God wants to relate to you and be with you is through the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who eternally is the begotten word of God. That word of God, that logos, which John the Apostle talked about so beautifully in the text here at Christmas, who became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. From the beginning was the means by which God wanted to make himself known to you personally. Not some ethereal, unknowable idea, but the God who walked with Adam in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day, uh, who, who knew him and spoke with him and, and hoped to find him even after he and Adam had rebelled against him. That word of God, who is Jesus, but who also is in person, but who also is the spoken truth that created the heavens and the earth, let there be light and was light. That word of God is Christianity is the relationship that God wants with you. To come into you and know you and make you and enlighten you and regenerate you and be with you. It's at the heart of everything Christianity does. And you see this, if you're a good Lutheran, you know this, we're going to talk about word and sacrament ministry. Ministries are where they spread a lot, around a lot today too, and people don't know what it means, it means service. Word and sacrament service, that God comes to you to give you this word, this person eternally begotten, reigning from heaven as a human being right now, down in the midst of us, by means of his truth spoken, it comes to you and with you as your king. That word about Christ, from Christ, who is Christ, 
who in his blood and in his flesh and in his baptism binds himself to you to restore you from death to life in the midst of this dark and evil age is Christianity. Those words from him and about him. You know this from the creed, which you were taught and you were confirmed. You say it every Sunday, even though if you're like me, you often miss it. You're not paying attention, that's normal. But it's there. It's there to teach us so that when you do need to remember, you know. I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried for me, yeah, for you, uh, who was raised on the third day. That word, that truth about who Jesus is and what he has done is God's relationship with you. King to slave, creature, creator to creature. The lie which the devil from the beginning has always used to try to undermine this relationship is to convince Adam and now you to take some little thing, some anything, and kind of, here's the word of God in the center of your existence as a human, he wants to take that other thing and just kind of put it right in there next to it and give it some sort of level with the word of God, level with the grace of God, level with the eternal justification which God speaks into you and creates into you. Broken is a book about the three most common or most normal ways of things that get put in with that word. What three things does the devil most commonly use to try to supplant that word about Jesus? Give it kind of a footing with it and then gradually move the word about Jesus to the side. And, uh, and have this other thing then become what we would call your, your idol. Right? What you worship instead of, instead of God. Alright, so what we're going to do in our first hour this morning is we're going to talk about those three major things. Actually, in Broken, we're talking about seven of them. Um, we're going to, in the second hour, we'll maybe look at some of the latter ones. Um, but the three major things, we're going to try to define them uh, and then try to, to see where they are in our present age, uh, their most common uses. Um, and then we're going to close this first hour um, with some Bible text talking about the, the opposite approach or God's approach from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. How is that uh, feedback feeling for you guys right now? Are you still yeah? Um, Pastor Philip, I think. So. Pastor Philip, there's still a bit of feedback in here. Um, it's kind of a, a silly thing, but working with video editing. Can never do this, but it can just be more than ever that the devil doesn't live inside of technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is he the place in the world? I push it a little bit here and there to see how high it goes. Yeah, it just keeps dancing with us. Can you still hear me in the back? Uh -huh. Yeah? Alright, we're still good. I don't hear any feedback right now. So, let's uh, slow down for half a second and, and talk about the story. Those of you who read the book, you know this story, but it's. Um, one that still to this day really strikes me. I can't say that this was an individual who I knew personally, but um, nonetheless, his, his story, uh, it, it was a big moment for me. I, if you know much about me, you know that I, even though I was born in the LCMS, I was raised in the LCMS, uh, son of a Lutheran church worker, now a pastor, a physician. Uh, I managed to ditch Lutheranism and Christianity sometime shortly before or after confirmation. Uh, <laughs> It should be kind of weird, right? Um, and uh, and become what uh, others have, have diagnosed as a moralistic, therapeutic deist, a, a person who believed in a God, but whose God basically wanted him to be happy, and the path to happiness was to be a good person. But let's leave good undefined. Uh, good is at best me wanting to be happy, right? whatever it takes to be happy. Um, as a result of this, my, my journey into Lutheranism uh, was a, a long and slow process and had a couple of of blips in the road, and it was certainly through uh, the world of evangelicalism. So I, I walked and lived among them for a while as well. And then as I came into Lutheranism, I, um, I started to ask questions about you know, what was different and why. Uh, anyway, in, in my vicarage, I, I had to teach a youth group uh, confirmation retreat, and we had to use these videos from something called Bluefish TV. Uh, which is a very popular evangelical uh, video production company based in California, you know, trying to have these really emotional and powerful uh, snippets that are going to get the kids to be on fire for Jesus and give their life to Jesus and the mission of Jesus. And um, we were supposed to teach all the way through this video, and uh, at the time I was still wrestling with my identity as a, as a professional Lutheran. I was 
Um, reading through the Book of Concord, I, I was becoming someone who wanted to be a Lutheran as opposed to just be a Christian. Um, but the story in this in this video that I had to talk about uh, was part of my stumbling. Then, uh, um, not not stumbling in a bad way, but literally stumbling over evangelicals. Uh, it's, it's a story about a guy I named Punk about John. I can't remember his name. Um, he, he's, everything about him uh, reminds me of. Oh, excuse me. I'm thinking of the wrong thing. I started the wrong story. Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm thinking of Emo Dan. Uh, uh, so we're going to totally shift. Oh, that was bad. That's really bad. Um, so, uh, okay, so I'm going to blend past the bell back. So I, I got in on a, a 10 o'clock flight last night, and the guy, the guy takes me out to dinner, which is awesome. And, uh, and at about, about 11.45, he says, so just so you know, uh, you have to be uh, up and ready at 6.55 tomorrow morning. They're going to pick you up. And so, so if I make you some mistakes, I'm down with this for kidding me. That was, that was it. So Emo Down, we'll come back to Emo Down in the video. Punk Rock John's a different story. Hold on. All right. This one struck me too, and this one, all the more because this guy um, was a loser. Oh, I totally set you up. So long. Um, Punk Rock John was uh, a kid. He was the son of a pastor uh, in a Lutheran church who grew up eating from the trough of evangelicalism, uh, eating from the ideas that relationship with Jesus is a matter of uh, singing songs, serving God, uh, and doing all you can uh, for the sake of the kingdom of God. And in some ways, this isn't all evil. There, evangelicalism gets its ideas from the Bible. Just Twist them a little bit, right? The challenge was that um, Punk Rock John, who, who loved to play in his punk rock Christian band and, and loved to sing the praise songs in church, um, one day he, he came across a website. Uh, it was an atheistic website uh, talking about why you can't have Christian punk rock. If you know anything about the punk rock culture, punk rock uh, arose in the late 70s and early 80s as a uh, a rejection of authority and, and really is connected to the philosophy, the um, political philosophy of anarchism, anti laws. So there's this long diatribe you read about uh, how you can't be a Christian and punk rock because punk rock is anti authority and Christianity is all about uh, supreme authority and obedience to your God, uh, which is not exactly true. But um, he was struck by this not because of how wrong it was, but because of how much it started to make sense to him. And he began, as a result, this young Lutheran Christian man who had faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, he began searching the internet for more information because he was so disturbed by the arguments put forward by the atheists. And you know, I think about atheists in America today, they're very, very progressive. Uh, they are more mission minded uh, than, than most, most of Christianity. They're very prepared and very educated in making arguments. And so he found them. He found these arguments. Well, sometime into this, um, uh, this journey of his, he does the right thing. He goes and he talks to his, his DCE, Director of Christian Education, the guy who maybe should have been his pastor, but nonetheless was there to serve him the Word of God. And he started confessing to him his, his struggle, that I'm not sure I believe in God anymore. Here are these arguments uh, from these atheists. They make sense. What should I do? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know what to do. The story, as it was being told me the first time I'm listening, like with Big of breath, wanting to know what happens next. And, and when what happened next was said, I just my stomach went fell out. Um, the answer, it, the answer that the guy gave him was, uh, after uh, kind of batting the issue around a little bit, was, well, what you need to do if you're having any doubts is you need to go home, you need to pray about it, and God will give you an answer. So the guy went home, he prayed about it, and at least insofar as how he had been taught to listen to God. That is through emotions. God didn't answer. I, I forget now how long the time frame whether it was six months or another year, but eventually he, he came to the conclusion that he wasn't atheist. Told his dad, um, told his dad, I love you. I love you to serve the community. I love what you do with the church, but I don't believe this stuff. But the reason that story strikes me so so hard is because I think it's a story that. Um, happens more than once in American Christianity, not just in Lutheranism, but across the spectrum. 
And it has to do with these three lies I mentioned earlier. These three different ways, these three different places that we are pointed to by the devil to find God in relationship with him, which in the end do not and cannot create faith. Now the wonderful thing about Lutheranism is we should know these things do not and cannot create faith because we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We know that that word of God that is close to you, that is in your mind and on your lips, is the word of justification by grace through what Jesus has done on the cross. We know that we're baptized into this and that this is the promise and proof. We know that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is a factual event that happened in history, without which we are in fact to be pitied above all people. And we know our scriptures as Lutherans. And so when we have young people coming to us with these questions, we should be able to give them an answer. Be ready to answer them and give them the truth of the facts of Scripture, not just some pious platitudes, and certainly not to tell them that God's going to speak to them when they pray. But then this is what's happening. Why? Why and how? How will we drop the ball so much? So as I um, as I struggle with that myself, having heard this story, and I struggle with the notes go back to Emo Dan. Emo Dan in his Bluefish TV video is a similar kind of situation, only it's being preached as if it's the gospel. So here's this video of this kid who's telling a story about a day of clouds and deep darkness, and he wasn't talking about Logan. And he was talking about a depressing afternoon after school on a Friday when uh, he had a bad day at school, and it, he wasn't sure if God was real or if God loved him anymore. So he was out walking on the playground. And just as in the midst of these great feelings of dread and despair uh, are happening, a cloud covers the sun. And so in the video, of course, in the minute, I mean, I gotta do the music, it's all really sad and <laughs> depressing and you know, you wanna weep and um, they got this really amazing like time still shot of the clouds coming in some of And so there's this moment where he just knows and he says this, I knew, I knew that there was no God. And then the music suddenly shifts. The more upbeat is the string on the guitar, yeah. And uh, and the clouds move off of the sun, the light shines, it says, and then then the cloud came out from under the sun, the sun was shining on my face, and I could feel its warmth, and I knew, I knew that there was a God, and that he loved me. So what? Is he worshiping Apollo? Okay. <laughs> I mean, really, this is what Greek mythology was, right? Is looking to, all paganism is this, looking to nature as the proof of God. And looking to nature to have God speak to you. Pantheism, the God is behind you, in nature. Yeah. Um, and here this is, here I am, a Lutheran vicar, having to try to teach confirmation to my, my you know, and I am definitely dangerous as a vicar because you can't like, undermine anything that's being done over you, but um, having to teach this somehow to these kids, to teach them that if they want to find God, they need to go search in their emotions for him, go search in their experiences for him. For one more thing, and then we'll get to defining the terms. So, meanwhile, now, this seminary and, and all the pastors in the room, um, at least uh, St. Louis, should remember this. We were asked to read this book um, uh, that was a strange little book. It, it was clearly published by a, a publishing house that didn't have the glory of CPH, who will be here later, um, because it was this uh, odd paperback um, that we had to order from, from way off in the corner. And it, kept, it felt kind of weird that the print was really small, almost like it was a PDF that had been photocopied. The book called uh, the, the Quest. For a holiness, a guy named Adolf Kaberly, who was a Danish uh, a Lutheran, I forget what era he was in. And it is, it is a horrible book. It is so hard to read. Um, it's like, you ever know somebody who name drops, right? Like to try to show up there, like I talked to this guy or I knew this guy, did you see this thing? Well, I didn't find him personally. This guy name drops every philosopher in 300 years and then tries to show you why they're wrong. And he does this for 300 pages. In the midst of this rather amazingly boring book, though, is some of the most golden nuggets of theology in the history of the world. I mean, it's from the Bible. He teases it out. He pulls it out. And what he does, step by step, in the most boring scientific way possible, he shows you how every single argument against the gospel, every single argument for justification by words, ends up going to justification by works in three different categories. And these are these three lies that we're going to be talking about. Um, these three different ways that God, that, that the devil, tries to slip some other thing into your world at its center to displace the word of God about Jesus from that center. Now, as, as Lutherans, we always think about justification by works as being like works, 
right? Like my hands. And that is one of them. Um, we'll just do that one first. It'll probably be the one we talk about least today. We would call that moralism. Moralism is the belief that your morals, your works, your good deeds, are in fact a means by which you please God or find God or, or get close, close to God or mediate yourself with God, overcome your sin with God, all these sorts of things. Moralism is not a belief that there is virtue, that there are morals, that there is good and evil. Moralism is the belief that by how I act with this good and evil, I can get closer to God. Or that if I, if I act as evil or find evil in myself, I am further away from God. And so my relationship with God is based upon what I do with my hands, more or less. Classically, you see this in Roman Catholicism, especially in their view of sin. We can see it also amongst evangelicals very regularly. Sin is always external. Sin is always what is coming out of you, but if you're tempted to do it, well, that part isn't really evil. Like, you're tempted to be evil, but you're not, you can't really be condemned for just wanting to do something wrong. Um, whereas, uh, you know, we would say with Paul, you know, James, that we, James, that we are tempted uh, when we are enticed by our own wicked will, our own wicked desires. Um, moralism, though, again, it, it thinks it's all external, and so it uh, would teach you then to shut down the evil within so that it never comes out, and if you can handle that, then you will be more virtuous, you are pious, you are a justified Christian. And then in Rome, the reason it's so interesting in Rome is then they even redefine morals. Morals include the Ten Commandments, but not nearly as important as that would be things like making sure you're mass every week um, and going to the fish drive. Um, really, I mean, this has become their new morality. So that's one of the three ways that Haverly shows we try to replace God. We try to justify ourselves before God through our morals, through what we do, through how we have. His other two ways, who I think are maybe more important, at least for our age, is not that moralism isn't dangerous or isn't there. It's always there. It never goes away. But he kind of always hides in the back. Meanwhile, the other two are always fighting for the front. And, and there's this, and we're going to do this in the second hour. There's this historical tracing that you can see them in the movement of Western civilization as these two modes of trying to justify ourselves are fighting for the heart and soul of American stomach, of Western civilization. Well, that was happening in America. Uh, we're going to get to that. Let's define them first, though. Um, the one that we're going to talk about first is the one that's been in these two stories I just told. Uh, Punk Rock John and Emo Dan both attempted to find God, to know God, to please God, to define their relationship with God based upon their emotions and experiences, based upon how they felt. Um, what Gabriel calls this is mysticism. Mysticism. Yeah. Number one, I give you listener fatigue. Um, mysticism is the belief that I experience God immediately. That's an important word. Um, we don't mean like right away when we say immediately. Uh, we mean without mediation, without something between me and God, like, say, the Word of God. Right? Um, instead of having the Word of God externally coming to me, whether it's written on the page or spoken into my ear, I have this internal, entirely uh, revelatory, apocalyptic even, uh, encounter with God, uh, this experience of God. Now, Christians who have been mystics in the past, particularly the, those who like the mystics of the Galatians and things, will say that this isn't really about emotions, but every time you hear them talk, you need to be careful and listen to the way they describe it. It always comes down to a matter of feelings. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean, like, I feel good, I feel bad, um, but it always comes down to an attempt to perceive God's will through what I feel through what I see, through what I experience. Um, mysticism. The other way that Kimberly uh, expresses uh, our attempts at self-justification, self-sanctification, uh, is counter to mysticism. In fact, it even, in some ways, hates mysticism, um, although they're, they're, they're also in relationship with each other. He calls it rationalism. So if mysticism is your mind, moralism is your works, that is your hands, and uh, th then rationalism is the attempt to get to God or find God or to find God or know God with your mind, with your understanding, with your speculations, with your knowledge. 
Um, now, before I go into that too much, again, I want to double say this. Nowhere does Kimberly or I will I tell you that morals are bad, that feelings are bad, or that knowledge is bad. In fact, the definition of theology is the knowledge of God, it's the true knowledge of God revealed by Him. So that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about rationalism. Rationalism is the attempt to, to find God without Him telling you who He is by speculating and thinking about who He is, trying to perceive Him. Now, the way that you see this uh, most today would be in an atheist, who in fact has decided that there is no God. By the use of his mind and speculation, he has come to these grand and sweeping conclusions that God cannot possibly exist. Uh, without any proof, mind you. Of course, we can't prove that God does exist. True, apart from the resurrection of Jesus. But, you know, he can't prove God doesn't exist, and unless he will state it, so obviously so, yeah, yeah. He has uh, placed his reason, his thinking, his logic, into the center of his worldview, of how he defines reality. And so, by displacing the word of God from that place, um, he is an idolater of his, his mind. Okay. So you have these three different temptations, I guess you could call them, these three different idols, these three different good things that God has created in our world, which are the devil's absolute favorite method for displacing the word of God in your life. You can go a lot of different directions with these ideas. I mean, Gabriel's book is really just trying to show you how every philosophy in the history of the world can be categorized in one of these three categories. Every great philosopher eventually points you to one of these three things as the ultimate answer to it. To reality, you can go that direction. Uh, you can go the direction of asking, you know, how are these things personally active in your life? Um, one of my favorite um, kind of sad stories, hopefully my grandma's not watching, but um, my grandma didn't like my book. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love my grandma, she's a wonderful Lutheran, but um, she she saw the seven rules from every Christian not to break as often as humanly possible, and she was really frustrated that I didn't have a list of seven things that she should try not to do uh, in the book. Um, I also have received uh, a couple of emails over time saying things like, you know, I've discovered um, uh, that I'm a rationalist, um, and I, I, I really am trying to, to stop being one, and so you know, what I need is, is a list of things I, mean I can do to stop being a rationalist. And if you come to that conclusion, either in this talk or from reading the book, I, I will humbly submit to you that you'll, you have to go back and start again at the beginning. You're kind of missing the point. The point is not that any of these three things can ever be overcome or go away. The point is that what Luther calls the old man who lives within you, that piece of you that is inherited by nature from Adam, who has his fallen will, his original sin, this is who he is. This is who you are. At your root, by nature, you're a moralistic, mystical rationalist. And you're flipping between these things day in and day out, trying to justify yourself before the living God, trying to define your relationship with God based upon these things, and you cannot save yourself from it in any way, shape, or form. Now, the gospel of Christianity is that Jesus has saved you from it entirely outside of you. Which is kind of amazing. Yeah. On the cross, by shedding his blood. Doubly so, his Holy Spirit has come to you and is, by this word, mediating to you this salvation, intervening with you, between you and yourself even, giving you some other thing to look to. What Luther calls the new man looks to the word of God instead. Uh, there is a strange and mysterious reality of you being simultaneously civil, um, both of these things at once. And so, you know, don't ever hear me saying that there is no there is no good in you as a Christian. There is. It's Jesus. It's his word. It's what you receive by faith, but by faith alone. And what's faith? Faith is trust in that external word of God. That by the Spirit's work is at war with your trust in these things. Today's talk, though, don't come out of this thinking, okay, I've got to get these things out of my life, I'm going to stop. The goal is to learn to, to, to diagnose, to smell in your life when you are tempted or being tempted by things that you actually want to worship that are not God, and then remember Jesus, that Jesus saves you from these things. If possible, then, especially to not confess these things and speak about these things as if they are your justification, but to confess with the church your own sin, be absolved of that sin to feast of the Lord's Supper, where you know that outside of you, 
something is being done to save you from all of this stuff. So at the last day, this stuff dies, and this is all that remains. Where you will love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind all the time, forever and ever, with your neighbor as yourself as well. But enjoy the before to that. But in the meantime, we walk in danger all the way, and this is the danger. The evil that lies within. The mystic within me, the moralist within me, the rationalist within me. These two pieces, like I said before, are the ones that are um, kind of always out at the forefront. The moralist is behind us every day. We're always moralists. We're always trying to set up rules for ourselves and trying to do things to make life work better. And not all of it's evil. And it was evil to replace our trust in these things. You know, I, I guess if I had to say, you know, where is my moralism most recently, um, I, I really hung up on... Uh, uh, trying to be efficient with my time and, and uh, manage my, my resources well. And so I've read some books on time management and project planning and all this stuff. And I have all these little lists that are going to help me get stuff done. Um, it's not that that's evil, right? I mean, it's not sin to try to manage your time. At the same time, what you see, in, you, you got to see this in your own context, in your own life, how you do it. All these things that we do to try to make life work end up killing us. Yeah? They end up destroying us. How do I feel at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when I look at my list of seven things I'm supposed to do and I really don't feel like doing any one of them? <laughs> I feel guilty. I feel guilty for breaking my own law. It's not even the Ten Commandments, a true law that I'm breaking that is making me feel guilty. It is my own law that I made up my own moralistic system. By which I am somehow hoping to make life work, and I'm still a therapeutic deist. I'm hoping that if I can just be efficient and everything, then I'll feel better about myself. Uh, but of course, then I'll know that God loves me. <laughs> right? I mean, this is, it's just, it's in our nature. It's just how we act to live. And the answer is not to reject time management. The answer is to repent and believe the gospel, to constantly cry out, Lord, have mercy, to confess my sin. Confess my idolatry and to know I can never get rid of it. Does this mean that I shouldn't try to be a good person? If you hear me saying that, then you're not listening. Of course you should be a good person. The problem is not about whether or not I'm doing good works to my neighbor. The issue is who do I worship? How do I worship him? And he has said, You worship me because I preach to you, Jesus. And the devil is constantly coming with these three things and trying to slip them in in front of Jesus, even in Jesus' name. Particularly, that, in Jesus' name. That's what happened to Punk Rock John. In Jesus' name, he was told to go be a mystic. Without the word of God, and apart from the word of God, you go find God by yourself in, the door, the, in a room with the door closed. And God will prove himself to you. Why, how? By burning in the bosom? By a revelation out of heaven? What? How? Where? And what if he doesn't? Does that mean God does not exist? Because that's the way this young man took it. God didn't prove himself. He doesn't exist. Um, I guess in some ways, also then, this is, and we'll get to this a little bit, mysticism then is the chief piece of the American Christian landscape today, um, made popular by what we would call the church growth movement, the CGM. All of us can't warn us though. Church growth movement and, let's say, revivalism. I'll spend a little time on that this morning, too. Um, what you see in your big mega churches, uh, for all of their authentic um, desire to do the right thing, because they do, not, not every single one, most of them, desire to be Christian, desire to help the church. They're not malicious in what they're doing, uh, the way the atheist often is. Um, for all of that, what they tend to be promoting and selling as Christianity is the mystical experience of God. If you come into our church, we will show you a feeling by which we prove that God is here. And we'll do this by manipulating you with some music. Um, and then we will give you some steps, look who's still hanging out, some steps to how to improve your life and have success. And whether those steps are about money or marriage, or money or marriage or money or marriage, um, 
those steps nonetheless end up becoming sort of the, the proof of your Christianity. So we're gonna we're gonna have you internally prove to yourself that you that God exists by the feelings which we sing you into and by pulling you into that musical experience. And then we're gonna have you prove to your neighbor that you're a Christian by how well you keep this list of rules. Now I don't know that any of them have actually written that down in those words as their plan, but if you kind of start diagnosing what's being presented by not only these individual congregations, but by the, um, the conferences that they're setting up and that they're doing all over the world, uh, that is what you find is, is going on. Um, why is that so scary? Because the Pope Dr. John is not alone. There's a whole other side of this issue, and I don't think it's just about mysticism. It also is about rationalism. It also is about the perfect storm of chaos blowing over America right now through our philosophy, through postmodernism, all these things. We'll be able to talk about that later. The fact of the matter is that the number of people that were 30 years old in church 50 years ago was significantly greater than the number of people that are 30 years old in church today. And if you... If you find the people who nonetheless are born into Christian homes and raised in Christian churches, and you listen to their stories about why they are no longer Christians, inevitably mysticism comes into play very strongly. They usually will have some reasons built into the, into the thing, uh, maybe evolution. But far more than that, what you find is that they, they, their experience of God that they were sold did not prove itself to be true. Um, I still remember, um, uh, did anybody ever read, I wrote an article that got published in Wolf Mueller's, uh, finally got published in Wolf Mueller's Around the Word. Did anybody read that uh, magazine he put out? I don't know. Um, an article called Amtrak Ignition that was about the most bizarre experience of my life Hands down, uh, my, my wife and I and our, our two kids at the time traveling across country on an Amtrak train to visit my parents in, in California, I think it was at the time. Yeah, I can't remember where we were going, but anyways, <laughs> it's midnight and I can't sleep with we're in coach. And, and so I I go down to the, the car where they serve food, what's that called? The um, cafe car or whatever. And I find out that there's this kind of bizarre, impromptu college party going on. But it's not like everyone's just going crazy. But there's like 12 to 15 people in there um, drinking and hanging out. And um, so I sit down, and, and you know, someone offers me a beer, and I, and I get into a conversation with a couple of them. And before long, it turns into a conversation on religion. I wasn't really seeking this out, but, but it's what happened. They were already doing it this way. They overheard one of the things and sat down because um, of what they were talking about. And I met the most bizarre panoply of people that night. Um, there was a, a, a lesbian uh, biker uh, who was so drunk she couldn't keep her head off the table. She's sitting there one right here. And then next to me is this uh, Jesuit-trained Roman Catholic materialist who, who formally will admit that he believes in nothing but the ability to go and get what is most important and seek pleasure at all costs, but nonetheless remains a Roman Catholic for the sake of the culture. Okay? So he's here, right? Um, my, my favorite one was the, the young uh, gypsy hippie, um, this, this former um, Methodist girl who now kind of believed in, in New Age, we all are God thing, and her big, uh, big theological statement of the night was that she hopes to be a flower in her next life so that somebody can, can pick her and smell her and find joy. Oh. Um, <laughs> evangelical youth group leader, now turned homosexual activist and homosexual, who was also fairly drunk and, and, and belligerent. Um, but nonetheless, you know, he's sitting there kind of moving around and having this conversation. Who's the other one? There's one more. What a panoply of people. How did I wind up in this, right? And my entire goal, I guess they, they want to talk about homosexuality and creation, because that's what people who aren't Christians want to get mad about, right, is, is six-day creation of homosexuality. Um, my entire goal of the night was to try to 
get the conversation off of that and onto the death and resurrection of Jesus somehow. Right? Um, but this is what it really is about. And the, the, the great moment was when the materialist Roman Catholic actually yelled at the rest of the table and said, don't you understand? The only reason that he thinks homosexuality is wrong is because Jesus rose from the dead and he believes what Jesus says is true. <laughs> <laughs> he got it. He didn't believe it, but he got it. Now, I bring this up again to show how in the midst of that conversation only one of them was a rationalist. And that was the Jesuit between Roman Catholic. The rest were mystics. Um, and so, and, and they were all formerly Christians. Right? They had all been in churches. And so what happens, where are these 30-year-olds going? Where are these 20-year-olds going? They're not giving up on spirituality. They're giving up on, and they're not even really giving up on religion if you define religion correctly. They're giving up on Christianity because the promise of Christianity to be mystical fails. Because it's not. It's not mystical. The most mystical experience you have as a Christian is kneeling, kneeling at the altar of the Lord, having bread and wine placed into your hand that feels and tastes like bread and wine, and hearing words outside of you say, that's not just bread and wine, it's the body and blood of God. That's the most mystical that it gets. It doesn't feel like anything but what it's not. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And yet it is, because he says so, because the thing that makes Christianity Christianity is the word of the Lord and not our feelings. And in some ways, everything about what he, what he has done with the new covenant is still coming too. And everything about what God has done with the old and new covenants is designed to kill mysticism and to kill rationalism. And so it's on purpose that God has created the least mystical possible experience as a place where he engages himself to you. And notice the least rational possible experience. I mean, it tastes like bread, it tastes like wine, break it, no blood comes out. Yeah. Where's Jesus? Well, he's, he's there. How? Oh, he said so. Why do you trust that? Well, he rose from the dead. Yeah, that makes lots of sense. Right? <laughs> you know, it's not rational either. Anyway, I'm kind of wandering a little bit. I'm convinced that the, the commitment to revivalism as the only possible salvation for the American church, which is the way it's pitched that, and has been pitched that way for 200 years, um, that commitment has done more to enable and drive out these younger people um, than any uh, clinging to stodginess uh, or tradition uh, could possibly do. Now, there are things to be said about stodginess for stodginess sake. It's not exactly great just to be stodgy. And, and there's something to be said about tradition done poorly. Um, I, mean, I, I can understand some of the critiques, but nonetheless, um, the real threat, the real, the real uh, um, poison that's out there is this pressing, pressing onslaught of seeking feeling or using feeling or trying to get people with feeling to be on fire for Jesus. Another story, I remember um, a lady in my congregation in Philadelphia, I've heard this story too many times, um, but this one, she, she sticks out specifically, um, telling me about how she just doesn't understand what happened to her son, her son's now in his 40s. So, you know, in college, he was just so on fire for Jesus, he was going around telling people about mission work, and he was, he was uh, reading his Bible, and really, really involved with Campus Crusade, that's right. He went off to college, he got involved with Campus Crusade, and he just he lit a fire in him, he never was like that before in his life. And now, I don't understand what happened to him now, he's um, married to a non-practicing reformed Jew, um, uh, and uh, never comes to church, ever at all, uh, has no uh, formal commitment to Christianity whatsoever, is just an American living the American life. Nice guy, nice family, great young grandson, played the violin very well, um, but no Christianity whatsoever. I don't understand, Pastor, what happened. He was on fire for Jesus. That's what happened. He was on fire for a Jesus who isn't Jesus. He was on fire for a false Jesus. A Jesus who immediately comes to you through your emotions. As opposed to the true Lord of life who comes to you by his word, which then gives us these mysterious sacraments uh, as well. So I'm convinced the more we can learn to smell mysticism, the better off we can be. And the more we can teach our kids to smell it, the better off we can be.
Rationalism also is out there and, and isn't going away. One of the scarier things about the church growth movement has been its gradual um, trickling into, it's not called this anymore, but into the emergent or emerging churches movements. And this has kind of faded as, as a word. Um, but what's going on behind this is the move from mysticism to rationalism. Um, we'll do this a little more in the next series, but there's an old idea called liberalism. It's not about the Democrats. It's nothing to do with politics. It's about the way you read the Bible. Uh, liberalism was a way of questioning the Bible based on its rational interpretation and going to the Bible as if it's just like any other book of history and trying to hold it to certain modern standards of, um, of criticism. Um, that was more or less rejected by a large portion of American Christianity, and evangelicalism is the direct result of that. So as the United Methodist Church, and the Congregationalist Church, and the Episcopalian Church, and the Lutheran Church, both the LCA and LCMS, were adopting liberalism, there's a revolt that goes on. One of the biggest names in this revolt is a guy named Billy Graham. Uh, and, uh, and the idea of fundamentalism, which is that no, 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 the Bible's true. And they come out, and they start this whole non-denominational movement that's really connected to this rejection of rationalism. Um, the crazy thing about all of this, though, though, is that now, though, is that through the revivalistic church growth movement and the reliance on emotion, it has gradually slipped into, under this guise of being emergence, teachers in evangelicalism who are reading the guys who taught the guys who were liberals. And we're beginning to promote ideas like there are things in the Bible that Jesus really doesn't want us to believe. <laughs> um, the most crass of these would be a guy named Rob Bell. Um, uh, a guy like Mark Driscoll uh, isn't quite off the deep end yet, although if you listen to Chris Rosberg, he's got some other issues. Um, but uh, so the, the, the weird thing about all of this is that mysticism is also shown, it tends to pave the way back to rationalism. Um, eventually, and, and it does so because the rationalist who's asking these questions about where is God and I can't find him in the emotions has to go somewhere. And if he's not going to give up his job as a pastor, um, he's got to find some reason to continue being a pastor. And purging the church of its irrationalism uh, is, a, is a laudable mission for him. Now, maybe that's uh, painting with too broad a brush. My point in this is, is saying that uh, and helping these people see this isn't gone in the church. Just, and in LCMS, the same reality. Just because we won the battle for the Bible in 1973 and kept the inspired and inherent word of God doesn't mean we actually believe it. <laughs> um, I still remember uh, uh, I met a guy uh, in Chicago who uh, knew someone I went to school with, and uh, he had left this guy's church. Uh, and uh, it had been a little bit of a struggle for him to leave. He didn't really want to leave, but uh, he had eventually confronted this friend of mine um, and, and said, you know, I don't understand why you know, you're saying and teaching what you're saying and teaching. Um, you know, I know you know <coughs> Pastor Fisk and, and what he's doing, um, so you know, try to explain this to me. And his answer was, uh, and now this is second hand, but his answer was, well, I, I take a more postmodern view of the confessions than Pastor Fisk does. That's some cold language right there. For the confessions aren't all true. <laughs> there, there are holes in that. Uh, we don't have to believe them. They are limited to their context. Now, maybe when I talk about the Lutheran Confessions to you as a crowd, it's over your head and you don't know what it is. Well, just take your small cabinets. That, that's the heart and soul of the Lutheran Confessions. Um, but also the Osborne Confession, uh, uh, which states in, in no uncertain terms basically the idea that, hey, we're sinners, uh, created by God, and fallen from the name of Jesus is the answer. We're saved by grace through faith. This is given to you in the church through word and sacrament, and creates the life of Christianity together. Um, these kinds of, of unalterable statements for which the original Lutherans were willing to die were now floating around in the rest of us as contextualized. In their time, it was true, but it's not necessarily true anymore. That is the postmodern mind. We're going to get there in, in the next, um, in the next uh, section. Before we go there, what I want to close our, our section with this morning, which goes for what, 10 more minutes? Is that right? 10 minutes? Um, is the antidote. Twice I'm going to try to do the antidote. The antidote is not broken in my book, my show, or anything like that. The antidote is the Bible, the antidote is Jesus. So if you have a Bible on your phone, 
uh, or otherwise, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Beautiful, beautiful text um, about that thing that God wants at the center, which is not you, which is not your emotions, which is not your words, which is not your mind. That thing which is Jesus. And not just some fuzzy idea of Jesus. And not just Jesus walking with the sheep, but Jesus crucified for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Um, of course, there's context that would help us understand why he's saying what he's saying. We're going to have to skip that for the sake of time today. But he starts off this section by saying very clearly a lot of what I've said to you so far. This thing that God is doing, that once he wants to put in his relationship with you, his way of mediating himself to you, this thing doesn't make any sense to our world in any of these three ways. Verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. God interacting with you by means of spoken words about a dead man on a cross 2,000 years ago is idiocy to the natural human being. It's stupid. And it should be, because I don't think it's true. It's folly. It makes no sense. However, but to us who are being saved through faith, trust in it, it is the power of God. What's the power of God? My victorious life, my grand emotions, my new good works? No. The word about Jesus, dead on the cross, is the almighty power of God in our present age. Hidden, veiled, uh, by folly, by foolishness, on purpose, to expose us for our own follies, he's going to say in a moment. For it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. God chooses to destroy what we think would make sense. That's what we, that's what ruined us. God made a perfect world. It is good, it is good, it is good, he said. And the devil comes and says, it can be better. All you need is a little bit of knowledge. All you need is the knowledge of evil. Huh? With a pursuit of greater wisdom, we broke the world. And so God, in his wisdom, decides to destroy everything that we would think makes sense. And so Paul says, verse 20, and he's asking this question, where is the rationalist? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Where? The cross. 21, for since the wisdom, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Since from the beginning it was not with our minds, or our emotions, or our words, that God mediated himself to us, but simply by his grace, as he walked with us in the cool of the day, and by his word as he spoke with us, it pleased him then to save us through that same faith alone, in the idiocy of the guy dead on the cross. 22, this is key to what we've been talking about. Four. Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. Love it. Jews are mystics, and Greeks are rationalists. Yeah? Jews want proof through experience. Greeks want you to scientifically explain it. Now, does that mean that today we the Jews are mystical? Please don't hear me say it. What he's talking about was the cultures of this day. There were two major cultures in which he was living, and they both had one of these or the four of what they used to prove truth. And for the, for the Hebrew, they were looking for signs from God. That's why I kept asking Jesus for signs. Jesus, the evil and adulterous generation is a mystery. Um, and the Greeks, Paul goes to the Areopagus and starts talking. They're all eager to hear something new. Here's a guy who will say something new. And he says, well, here's the sign. Here's the proof. He rose from the dead. <laughs> the point of 22, then, is that all of us, always want to see God prove himself through this. And God's refusing to do that for our own good. Refusing to do that. So instead, 23, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to mysticism and idiocy to rationalism. But, 24, to those who are called, gathered in life and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, both Jews and Greeks, that is, your race doesn't matter whatsoever, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So as much as for the unbeliever it's folly, and has no proof emotional to the believer, the one who has faith regenerated in them, to the sinner, 
There's guilt that he needs forgiveness. God's almighty power by which he created heaven and earth are at work every time Christ is preached for you. 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The folly of the cross outwits us and outdoes us, kills us and raises us. And the weakness of the cross says to us, you're still a sinner, but my grace is sufficient for you. And we're going to skip over the next section in which he kind of talks to the Corinthians about how uh, not many of them are, are super powerful, not many of them are rock stars in the real sense, none of the else in this sense is a joke. Um, the, uh, uh, he's going to talk about how, how they're not famous, they're not powerful, they don't really have much in the world. Um, but God chose them because they're sinners. He chose them because they're weak to humble everything. So verse 30, and because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us, to us, wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Notice, Jesus is your sanctification. So it is written of the one who boasts and boasts in the Lord. What is the boast of the Christian? What is the confession of the Christian? The creed. I believe in the Father who created, I believe in the Son who redeemed, I believe in the Spirit who saved by forgiving sins. That's all I got. I got nothing else on the last day, nothing to lift up to God. Just the creed. So Paul says in chapter 2, So when I came to you, brothers, little Corinthian church, I didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I didn't come with PowerPoint slides and tricks and ways to try to convince you. I didn't come with ways to manipulate you into understanding me or, or gimmicks to get you to, to, to listen more often. I didn't try to figure out how to change the worship experience to make you love it. No. I decided there's two to know nothing among you except Christ and the crucified. That's it. I came to to say nothing, to do nothing, to, to have nothing but the plain and clear word of God, which, yes, it's stupid, yes, it's folly, but no, it's actually salvation, and it's true, and it's real, and it's eternal. I was with you then, verse 3, in weakness, and in fear, and much trembling. Right? He didn't have power among them. And my speech and my message were not impossible in words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's the demonstration of the spirit of power. What's he talking about? Is he talking about all the miracles he did when he was with him? I don't think so. He's talking about the demonstration of the spirit of power in the folly and weakness of the cross preached. That here I am, coming to you, Greeks, telling you about a guy who died on the cross and rose from the dead for the salvation of your soul. And you actually believe it. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. Taking a dead man and making him alive. Yeah. Not, not just Jesus, but you, your spirit. Dead, an enemy with God, now alive, simply by this word about that one man who did die and rise for you. Now, lest we foolishly think that this is actually foolishness, like I've used the word stupid or idiocy before, he wants to make sure it's not actually stupid. It's not actually idiotic. It's just stupid and idiotic to this way of seeing the world. Right? Among the mature, among the faithful, we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. That is, the wisdom of grace, the wisdom of mercy, something that we as humans just have no concept of. It's the wisdom that Paul learns later, I think, in the same book, when he says to God, take away this thorn in my flesh. Take away this sin. If you will only remove this one thing from me, then I can live the rest of my life for you. God says no. My grace is sufficient. That's the wisdom. That is, is unbelievable. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., for all of them not necessarily being Christians, um, they got this. And it changed the world when they did it. They got that grace is actually stronger than justice. It's kind of nuts. This is the eternal truth of God. Now, I'm not saying go follow God in the name of the King Jr. in the theology. I'm saying this is who Jesus is eternally. This is who Jesus is making you to be eternally. One who lives first and foremost not in a world of obedience, in a world of rest, in a world of turning the other cheek because it's good. Yeah. Because God has turned his cheek to you on the cross. Verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood this. If they had it, we might have crucified the Lord of Lord. But as it is written, when no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, 
when God is prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. The Spirit says everything, even the depths of God. Now he goes into this kind of side thing about how, we can, how the Spirit knows what God is thinking. Let's get ahead to 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, that we might understand grace, that we might understand mercy, that we might understand the atonement, purchasing power of the blood of Jesus shed for you. And we impart this, we give this, not in words taught by rationalism, but in words taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. That is to say, creating life where there was no life before, making faith in you who were uninsured, unbelievable. Now, this next section, and then we'll close on, I'm uh, just looking for 14, 15, 16 minutes. It's sort of like him hedging off um, one of their questions. Throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, there's a couple ways to interpret the book. I, I lean toward the edge where there are these statements that Chloe, who was a member of the church, sent in a letter to Paul saying, these are the things that are being said here. You need to answer these things. You need to talk about these things. And one of these statements, I'm convinced, is the first half of verse 16. Who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? was being banded around in the same way that a postmodern day will say to you, who are you to say what the Bible says? How can you know what God really meant? Yeah, I know it says no, but it's just your interpretation. This is what's being said in and around Corinth. And Paul is driving home, no, 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 no. This is not our interpretation. We actually know what God is saying. But we also know that in verse 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are followed to. Right? By nature, we don't believe what God says. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. By faith alone, he actually believes them. But the spiritual person, the Christian who has faith, judges all things. By the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, you know all truth that ultimately matters. And you can actually judge all things, not by your own will or reason or strength, but by the Word of God, which is final. But himself is judged by no one. Why? Because he's been judged innocent by God. And so when someone says, who has understood the mind of Christ so as to instruct him? How do you know what the Bible says? How can you possibly be so bold as to say what God has done? We have the mind of Christ. Where? In Christ crucified. In the grace of Christ poured out as an atoning sacrifice for your justification, for your innocence, for your salvation, to take away your sins, remove them as far from you as east is from the west. And because of that, Every other word that God has ever said is true. You can believe it. You can say it and you can know it. That faith that the Spirit works within you then begins to boil over into the good confession, uh, which is on our top. So, at the heart, the center, Christ crucified. Three things, always trying to get it out of the way. Uh, in the next section, we're going to try to see how these things aren't just about you individually, but have cascaded through history and brought us to where we are in America at this moment. So. Thank you, Pastor Fitz, for the first section. We're going to take a brief break. I'm going to keep the stream live so that it doesn't break it up. And we'll come back about 10.30 so you're able to get refreshments, able to use the restroom. We'll have CPH selling Fisk's book outside afterwards. You can buy other CPH products, Bibles, all kinds of things. Concordia Publishing House is here. We are going to set that up for you now. There's a fifth, there's a book signing for Pastor Fisk's book at from noon to 12:30. So stick around. If you brought your book, he'll sign it. If you don't have a book, guess what? CPH has one for you. So you may enjoy your 15 minute break.
missing keys, I have them in my possession. I guarantee you will find me when you try to go to your car today, so I'm not too, too worried about it, but I do have the keys here. 
So the next section, how this next session works, is that we've got uh, the next section on this presentation, and then directly after that, there's time for question and answer. Um, I did want to tell you that if you're watching it live, that this will be on YouTube. You can go to it when you get home and watch it. I know the quality is not the greatest live stream because it is a laptop camera that I'm streaming from. Mm -hmm. However, the camera directly behind it is in HD. So tonight when I get home, I will chop it up. I will put it online for you in HD. You can go to Salem's website, the same place that you went to register it. Mm -hmm. You can go under Media and Educational Videos. It will be right there for you. You can access this in HD at any time. You want to watch it, share it with whomever you want. So that's available at www.salembjmo.org slash church. So there you go. It's for you. Enough about that. Back to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Give you guys a minute to continue coming back. Um, we'll definitely do, uh, again, the question and answer. Afterwards. However, if in the midst of this uh, you need clarity on any uh, small item, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, if I say something that seems really off the wall, I certainly wouldn't want it to get lost in the shuffle. Um, so, um, our goal now for this next hour is to kind of combine two things. Um, try to give you a picture of why we are where we are in American culture today, um, using those three lies of mysticism, moralism, rationalism, but not necessarily those words, but tracking uh, their war with each other for the mind of humanity uh, over the last 2,000 years plus. Um, combining that with then uh, what I also try to show in the rest of the book, um, these, these philosophies, these worldviews, these idols, they're not so clean cut and dry as it is when you write them on the board. Uh, they, they also can kind of work together. And so they, they bring about um, sort of uh, children, as it were, uh, permutations uh, that can be named a bit differently and, and a bit more directly. Um, uh, that they have. So we're going to try to pull up some of that as well. If you've read the book, you know, I'm talking about pragmatism and prosperity, um, uh, the silver bullet, and, and those things. So we're going to try to talk about those as well. Um, and closing again with some, some more scripture. Uh, trying to capture the rise and fall in the history of Western civilization in, in 30 minutes um, it's probably a stupid thing to do. Uh, but it's kind of a fun exercise as well. Uh, certainly, I'm going to be painting with a very broad brush. And so if you are uh, a Western Civ professor watching online, please judge me gently. I, I'm not trying to be definitive uh, so much as to paint uh, the winds of change and name them as they wrestle for dominance of the human spirit. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, the first sort of well-known or, or uh, influential in the West rise of rationalism, which happened many, many years before Jesus uh, with the Greeks. The Greek philosophers, who I know you've heard some of these names even if you don't know what they taught. Uh, Aristotle and Plato being the two most well-known, but there were many of uh, these men in these schools. Uh, their individual teaching, while it's fascinating in its own right, is not nearly so important as what this represented for the, for the evolution of human civilization, which was the, the awareness that we could, with our minds, test and ask questions about the world we live in and find answers that then reproduce themselves wherever we ask the same question. Yeah. And so in that way, this is the, the underpinnings of, of what we would call science or the scientific method, although nothing necessarily quite that detailed. But the idea that, that mankind, in this world of chaos, in this world of, of storms and disease and warfare, uh, is not simply a, a, a servant of the winds of change but can observe these things 
learn from them, apply them, and improve his state with his mind. Uh, this was the, the grand uh, contribution of Greek philosophy and the Hellenistic culture, which was you know, spread by, you know, listening to Alexander the Great, uh, who with the sword took this way of thinking to the entire Mediterranean world and beyond. And even though he eventually, uh, eventually he dies very soon, um, the, uh, the Roman civilization that, that comes up on the heels of this basically just sits on the foundation of Greek thought. Yeah. Um, this was then the first age of rationalism, right? The birth of it in some ways. And this isn't all bad. I'm not talking about this in terms of sinfulness. There was something really great about being able to figure out that I could study how the storm destroyed my house and build my house so the next storm doesn't destroy it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Goodness, this is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, this rise then of Roman culture, though, has uh, a couple of really interesting things happen. Um, a, it spreads. You know, it's bigger than any civilization up to that time, possibly with the exception of ancient China. Um, but it, within its region, certainly the broadest kingdom uh, that was ever seen. Um, and, and brings uh, this science and this, this thinking uh, to that civilization in terms of its political culture, its political thought, the idea of a republic, right, things like that. Um, uh, it's roads by which uh, you could travel. There were mail systems. Uh, people were able to move to other parts of the world and then move back. I mean, this was just new, right? was brand new ideas. Um, uh, as well as this aqueducts and water, medicine, um, all sorts of things. Which brings about something of a very prosperous time in Rome itself. Uh, Rome, as the center of the world, suddenly is the center of world influence. Uh, um, and it has a kind of a grand success uh, with its armies flung to the four corners of the earth, they're bringing grain back to Rome. And life in Rome is very, very good. So when something happens in Rome, it happens in every culture where prosperity happens. Um, they get a little decadent. They start to take for granted what they have. They start to perceive themselves as sort of uh, having a right to and always going to have this life which they, which they uh, are enjoying. They take advantage of it. And so you have a, a real decadence that's taking place. Now, underneath this, of course, is what's going on in Israel with Jesus. Now, Jesus is in the middle of this Roman uh, uh, rise of power, this thousand-year reign uh, of the Roman Empire. Um, Jesus is underneath it. He's in the back corner. Um, he, he, although certainly news traveled faster in Rome than it had ever before, it wasn't like he was on the front page of the newspaper every week. Um, most of what he was doing was entirely hidden at least until after his resurrection, and after the apostles had uh, been sent out uh, to the nations. But that's the world in which Jesus is uh, doing what he's doing, and which the apostles are going to do. And so, from our text just a few moments ago, Greeks seek wisdom, right? That's the world they live in. But then that Hebrew culture was still caught up in signs and wonders, connected to what they saw and read in the Old Testament. Uh, particularly the God of Wonders, who had brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So it makes sense in some ways that a Hebrew would ask the person who says, I'm the Messiah, you know, prove it. Moses gave us manna to eat in the wilderness. What are you going to do for us? Now, the problem was they weren't asking for faith. They were asking uh, for their bellies. Jesus calls them on that. But, point being, mysticism is alive in Israel, but the world is really dominated by rational thought, and for good reason, is providing prosperity to them. However, uh, the decadence kind of destroys them. Uh, they grow weaker and weaker. In fact, we, even that I said a moment ago, the thousand-year Roman Empire, it wasn't a thousand-year empire. It was a thousand-year republic that actually became an empire because the republic got so weak it couldn't no longer survive and it required a strong man to come in and save it. Uh, and that was the first emperor. Um, if you're familiar with the thought of Nietzsche, it's this sort of proto-Nietzschean uh, Uberman kind of stuff. Um, if, if that makes any sense, if it doesn't work like that. Um, but it's, it's, it's scary. It, it, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, even the emperor eventually cannot maintain the glory that is Rome. And uh, Rome gets so decadent, so incapable of defending itself, um, 
that it is eventually sacked. Now we're skipping over a lot of things. We're skipping over Constantine and, and the divide of the of empire and two halves all stuff. But Rome eventually gets destroyed by the Visigoths, uh, who are these barbarian rulers that come down. Um, until the Hun theoretically is somewhere in there as well. And what happens is this great philosophical prosperity is um, is lost. And the rise of pagan cultures around Rome uh, destroys much of the thought of Greek philosophy that had been there. So you have these different pockets of regions that have been controlled by Rome in which uh, the rising culture no longer is a thinking culture, but a, a strictly um, pagan culture. Which is then counteracted by the only power that remains from Rome, which is the Roman Catholic Church, which during this time period uh, had been made officially part of the government. And so had license, I don't mean that in a sinful way, they had the official license to say, we in fact speak for God and country. And what goes on then is as these pagan cultures rise and are destroying knowledge, uh, the Christians are trying to re uh, retain it and maintain it. So all of the knowledge that we have most of it, um, about everything that went on here happens and is, we have it still today because of the state and the monasteries um, of the Christian monks that were setting themselves apart from the decadence and then so were able to survive the destruction of took place. Meanwhile, this rising pagan culture begins to fuse with medieval Catholicism. As it begins to, does, results in medieval Romanism. So that with the decline of the aware, thinking, uh, literate serf, which you might have had, the literate slave, which you might have had in Greek culture, and the rise of the Germanic pagan serf, who's just a farmer and doesn't know anything else, um, you have. A, a shift in the culture toward mysticism, toward super, superstition. Yeah? Um, but this fuses with the dominant power of the day, which is that Roman Catholic teaching. This isn't on purpose, this isn't overnight, but over the course of some 500 years or so, you even have a, a serious, serious decline in the way that the Christians are reading their own texts and a rise in their belief in magical powers. And so you start to have things like the finger, finger bone of St. So-and-so off, you know, uh, 500 miles away that you want to go see because you think it'll get you a miracle and save your dying child. Um, and this is actually being preached. You know, you come down to Rome and uh, climb up these steps on your knees uh, and you're going to earn so many years off of purgatory. Now, again, this isn't overnight. This is over a significant period of time. In fact, 500 is probably a little small uh, We're going to kind of take this thing all the way up to 1400. Um, or so, again, broad brushes here. Uh, you have this rising mysticism. It's sort of the important thing to see. And it is the mysticism of superstition, which is a marriage of pagan religion with Christian symbolism. Okay? So if you can imagine if I were to take a pagan religion and put Christian makeup on it, is kind of what's going on that results in what ultimately is the medieval case. Does this mean that there were no Christians in the Catholic Church? It's not at all. Uh, there were faithful Christians everywhere throughout the history of the church. But there's a gradual rise in those Christians' uh, trust in mysticism, right, and a decline in their trust in rationalism. However, some of these monks in these monasteries discover a few things. And so somewhere in here as well, you have the seeds of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, which comes kind of on the heels of the Renaissance, or the twine. <laughs> you have the rediscovery of Aristotle and Plato and Greek philosophy uh, by these monks. And as they're reading uh, these great works, and they are great works of thought, um, they're, they're captured by and they start to emulate them, and copy them, and write more, and study more. Mathematics is revived, science is revived, um, uh, Mendel right, is, is writing during this time period. Um, and the arts get revived, they begin to study the human body again as an artistic form, and so you have this imitation of Greek art, 
uh, in Greek statuary, Roman statuary, and guys like Michelangelo um, and, uh, and uh, Da Vinci. So um, this period, yeah, 1600 in here is really the Renaissance, and I might kind of did it this way. You know, and every scholar who talks is going to give you a different date for where it actually starts. No one really knows where it actually starts. Um, but it's, it's happening here that that rationalism through Greek philosophy is coming back and beginning to compete with the mysticism. So much so that a guy like Thomas Aquinas takes it upon himself to explain the mysticism and to explain how it works and why it works and why it's true in the most scientific and boring way possible. He had this fantastic work. Unbelievably uh, genius work of cataloging everything that was basically ever said in the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church and trying to prove it to be true. Um, that's how rational they were about their <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, what happens then, though, and you can see in this, between these two items, you have a guy named Martin Luther, who as a child of this study, has learned Greek and Hebrew. And he's read not only the church fathers, but the philosophers. And he believes heartily in the medieval Christian mysticism, which is paganism of the Roman Catholic papal sacrifice of the mass. And it's not healing his conscience. Because he's still being thrown back on his own mysticism and his own rationalism and his own works. And so he starts to ask questions, and the Reformation is a result of those questions combined with his rational reading of scripture um, that sees that the mystical sacrifice of the mass is not what scripture talks about, rather there's a once for all sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And we're, and we're not going to do a whole history of the Reformation here, but can you see how, I hope it's going to make sense, Luther was a product of his time. This was, God set this up to bring back what had initially happened here, the turn part of the world upside down and had been covered by pagan culture. And he used rationalism to do it, yeah, to, to open Luther's mind and other people study the scriptures and understand it. All right. But it doesn't stop. And so coming out of this, you have the Enlightenment beginning in something that we might call the modern age. Again, a term that is thrown around a bit cavalierly and maybe is not defined enough. But if, if, if I were to tell you to define the modern age as anything, it is whatever moment it was that we truly shifted from medieval superstition, medieval mysticism, being the dominant way of thinking as human beings in Western civilization, thinking with our feelings, our experiences, to um, rational thought as the dominant way of thinking. Science as the way by which we test truth. Um, technology on cue, yeah? Um, with that, there come a whole host of dark horses, uh, the least of which is not a growing trust in material. How do you use it? Let's call it, this is a funky word, but it's really, really helpful. Um, I am in. Let me spell it wrong. The two P's, I think that's right. Empiricism. Empiricism is a, a, a dominating trust in the physical world to tell me what truth is. In some ways, it's to say anything that can be known can be proven and tested. Uh, that, or to say another way, the only real is the physical. Things which are spiritual, they may be ideas, but they're not real. Um, and with this growing empiricism of the modern age, then, you have children of Enlightenment Christianity in the 17 to 1800s <coughs> beginning to go back to the same scriptures that had reformed the church and to ask questions about them from a material, modernist, rationalist viewpoint. Questions like, um, how could a man feed 5,000 people with two loaves of bread and five fish? Did I get it backwards? Five loaves of bread and two fish. <laughs> um, 
They start to question the miraculous nature of the Bible. And at first, these are soft questions. These are exploratory questions. But they gradually become uh, dominating assertions. And so you have, like I mentioned earlier, the rise of Christian liberalism, which by 1800s, late 1800s, uh, Europe has almost entirely taken over um, uh, the schools. Um, it takes longer to get to the United States. Uh, it doesn't really come to a head here uh, in the Missouri Senate. There's always even 20 years behind us in the United States uh, until the 1970s, right? But the seeds of all of that, the heart of all of that is what's going on uh, in liberal modernism. Trust in the mind, the rise of the new rationalist stage. And so for hundreds of years, really, um, you have a culture, a civilization in which trust in the power of the human mind is divine. We can do anything if we just put our minds to it, right? Um, we can go to the moon, and unless you're completely not, we did. Yeah. Um, we can go to the moon, we can, uh, I mean, golly. This thing was like a joke on TV in the 1950s, right? I mean, I, I would have had to flip it open, right? As a couple of seconds left, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, you know, what, what, what science has brought us, what modern age has brought us, so don't hear me again. I'm not talking about sin at this point. I'm talking about the dominant worldview creator being an age of reason for this period. Now, why am I doing this? I'm trying to get to where we are and the fact and the truth and the amazing, strange reality that in somewhere around 1963 or 4 or somewhere in there, the whole thing flipped again. And actually, you could also just say it happened in 1910. Um, I'm out of board space. I can't, I feel bad though, because then, like, those who forget history are going to repeat it. So, we'll start with just the modern world, modern scientific. Rationalism, trust in the human mind. And we'll have that be um, 1600 to 1910 slash 63. Um, somewhere in there. <laughs> and, and there's a reason for those numbers. Like this. There's a reason for those numbers. I'll try to explain that at home. Um, it should be okay. Talk amongst yourselves. This is where the technical difficulties we play. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, with this grand, and again, I say liberal not because it's bad, but this freeing view of the mind. I think therefore I can test and, and see and know and make it so. The turn of and dawn of the 20th century, the 1900s, um, was a time of fantastic optimism in, uh, in Western civilization. Uh, everyone believed that we were <clears throat> basically nearing the age of the millennium. They were even talk this way. By millennium referencing the reign of Christ, they weren't necessarily meant talking about the return of Christ. No one believed that was going to happen. Instead, what they're talking about is achieving the paradise on earth. We were going to heal disease, we were going to stop having wars, we were going to explain the universe, and we were going to live in perfection and peace. That was the attitude and the trust that people in general, the culture, had placed on the human mind. And then instead, 1910, 1914, World War I, where the great scientific achievements of, of the last hundred years came to bear in one of those bloody and nonsensical violent pursuits in human history that we're aware of, or nobody even knew what they were fighting. Um, the left Europe just destroyed. Um, the result of that war uh, 
wasn't, I mean, it, it affected everything immediately, but the result on philosophy, on the way men think, didn't happen like this. But you had great minds uh, begin to question these pres uh, 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 presumptions about the power of the mind. I skipped something I should have mentioned earlier. Underneath all of this modern scientific rationalism, you have an ongoing counter movement in many of the schools and the arts as well, um, which is called romanticism, officially romanticism, which isn't about Valentine's Day, uh, but was a, a reaction against the trust of the human mind. Uh, and so it was lifting up and saying, no, 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 the science mind rational thing is cold and confusing. The real life, real, real truth is found in experience. One of my favorite examples of this is a poem, I think it's well known. Um, I can't say the whole poem, I wish I could. But uh, the poem, he describes how he's sitting in the classroom, a lecture hall, hearing a teacher talk about astronomy and describing the movements of the stars. And so there's a picture of this giant black hole, kind of like that, where it's just covered with arrows and numbers and all this stuff. And he says he's, he's in the back of his classroom and he's just. He's born and he's falling asleep. And so he gets up and he walks out onto the lawn. And he stands beneath the sky and is awestruck and angry. That's a romantic poet hating the modern scientific world and saying, all of this is a waste. We need experience. Don't think, feel. Um, so this is going on underneath this, and there's some other names. I, there's a number of well-known names of artists and poets, musicians that, that emulate this. Um, you can think, and this isn't exact, but you know, if, if Bach was uh, was a rationalist musician, his music's like math. It's very plain, very controlled, very on purpose. Mozart was the romantic. Mozart's just flying everywhere, writing whatever he feels like writing. Yeah? Um, it, it's a crass analogy, but it, it, it does explain. Um, so, in 1910, then, these guys start to say, see, we were right. All this reason, what did get us? Nowhere. And you have a lot of turmoil and turnover very quickly. Uh, a bunch of different schools of thought, and I shouldn't say thought, but unthought begin to rise. Schools of experience begin to rise. Um, you also have, uh, it happens again with World War II, uh, you have ideas like uh, uh, communism and fascism. And Marx was thinking of communism, uh, and Nietzsche, I um, uh, can't spell his name very well, uh, uh, put on, the, on there, but they can't think of it. You have a lot of different ideas hitting against each other. But even like Marx, you know, he rejects the individual, which means he rejects the individual mind. Um, he, he lifts up the worker as part of the community, which is what fascism is about, is about community. Um, all these things are, are bubbling and, and, and boiling underneath the surface. It's in 1963 that the work these guys started doing back here finally gets to the point where it tips over the universities. And so on the universities now, the majority of the staffs are romantics. They don't necessarily say that, but they're a form of romanticism. Um, and they're no longer uh, uh, rationalist in their, in their pushes. And so you see the movement of the hippies and the rebellion of the 60s as a direct result of the very planned indoctrination uh, that took place following World War I um, by the Romantic Counter Group, which ultimately leads to what we would call postmodernism, with or without life, it doesn't matter. Meaning nothing more than after modernism, but in shorthand, the new mysticism. Or, more logically described, Irrationalism. Very much on purpose. Um, meaninglessness. Now, there's other things going on in this. The phrase postmodern itself uh, comes out of language theory, uh, which is all about how words work and how translation works and how we communicate and whether when I say something you understand it and if not, why and how. Um, and the works of uh, guys like Derrida, doesn't matter if you know his name, 
they, they begin to, to posit that human language is so incomplete that it actually doesn't work. And so while you think you are understanding what I am saying, you are so confined to your own personal experience that you're basically creating your own understanding and responding to what you think I'm saying. But you're not actually understanding what I'm saying. Imagine guys writing books this thick to explain this. <laughs> you can see the kind of funny hypocrisy in that, right? I, I read your book, and I think I know what you said. Um, what happens, though, with this is, is what you might call the death of words. And it's not that everyone just said, oh, I, I think Paradox is great. But what happens is coming out of this hippie movement, you begin to have people believing that we can't actually know truth. What's true for me, that I say, may, because of your context, be entirely different to you, and so therefore not true for you. And I know you've heard people talk about it before. Um, that is all coming out of this stuff, and the skipping movement, the, the postmodern language theory, all this stuff, um, you know, to where we are today, the dominant Worldview, the dominant way by which humans in America make their decisions about truth is no longer rational in any way, shape, or form. It's entirely emotional based upon their perceived needs in the present moment. And this is a result of an intentional shift in the culture, rejecting the scientific age as something that only brings us war, and believing that this new age of emotion, the age of Aquarius, they call it in the 60s, uh, will will actually I'm serious. Will actually bring us uh, to the paradise of rationalism could not bring us to. Um, imagine uh, there is no heaven. It's easy if you try. Imagine all the people living as one. That's it. I mean, it's not just a song. Uh, it's mysticism at its at its heart, preaching the gospel of not forgiveness of sins, but no sin. The gospel of perfection and peace that we all just feel good together. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, there's a reason. There's a reason that marijuana was part of this movement. I mean, it's easier to say that, but we all just feel we all just feel good together. We're okay. If you feel these are chemicals. Um, you know, makes sense. So, um, what's your time? All right. Um, I fast forward a little bit to getting here. So, 60s, boil into 70s and 80s. Um, you don't see postmodernism yet dominating. It just has flipped into schools. And you have the first generation of 30 year olds that are now feeling rather than thinking. So, you who are in the greatest generation, if you're still here, you've been influenced by this more than you think by TV over the last 15 years, but you still probably are a rationalist. And I'm not saying this in a bad way, I'm saying you probably think before you think. If you are born any time after 1963, you just gotta know, you feel before you think. It's who you are. Right? And I'm not calling this good or bad. I'm saying it's what it is. Yeah. They're both dangerous when we idolize them. Um, God created both emotions and thought, so we should strive to, to actually see both of them in the proper places. But just know this when you're talking to somebody about homosexuality, they're not listening to your argument. They're not listening to the logic of what you say. That doesn't even matter. All they're de dealing with is the feelings that they already have about the issue. And then your feelings, which are against them, do this. This is conflict. And the answer to conflict for emotion is who has a stronger emotion? So whoever has a stronger emotion wins. And this, believe it or not, is Nietzsche. The Uberman. The man with the will to win. To do what must be done no matter what. The Uberman without thought and only with feeling. The man with enough emotion to drive down everyone else's emotion. So in the 1980s, you still don't see this dominating everything, but you see it making inroads and gradually undermining uh, what formerly we would have called virtues or morals or mores. And I'm going to use marriage not because, well, partially because it's a hot topic, but partially because it's it's been a fight that's been around so long, and it's only right now that we're like, oh, this fight, um, <laughs> when, when it gets to homosexuality. I mean, this is so much deeper. What happened in 1963? Roe versus... Oh, I'm sorry. 73. Roe versus Wade. What happened in 1972? 
I don't have a date for divorce, but it's back in here. It was Thursday. Um, and then no fault divorce, somewhere in there, which is scary stuff. Um, so you have marriage being redefined already. Yeah? You have marriage being redefined already. Anybody watch? Anybody watch the uh, very poorly planned President Obama interview with the comedian? It was on YouTube. Yeah, how many? Not very many. I, I don't know that I can recommend it. If you want to see someone who doesn't understand comedy, um, watch it because the president really doesn't get comedy. Um, <laughs> the the interviewee interviewer is this guy from the Hangover movies. This kind of crass, mm -hmm. overweight slob. On purpose, right? He's trying to be funny. He asks inappropriate questions, and he does this to everyone who he interviews. And it's funny because it's so inappropriate. And so, you know, the, the person who uh, watches this or who is, who is being interviewed is basically supposed to laugh at and laugh at themselves and just kind of give their answers. Well, the current administration has decided that they want to promote something called Obamacare. You want to hear um, <laughs> and so they're they're trying to to, um, to promote this. And so they're like, well, this guy's kind of hot. He's doing his interview system. Let's use this. Yeah, I don't have a problem with any of that, right? So they they um. They have him on. The problem is that he doesn't understand he's supposed to laugh at himself. And he ends up being meaner to the interviewer. And the interviewer is in, in him. He ends up looking very poor. But why am I bringing this all, all this up? Because the interviewer, in the midst of these questions, one of the questions he asks is, why don't you try making divorce illegal for homosexual marriage and see how many of them still want it? <laughs> Think about it. And, and I'm not saying that to be against homosexual marriage. I'm saying, look how long marriage has been redefined. You know, people not even uh, actually, they were probably yelling a lot about them and over the and then over time, they just forgot. Okay. Now, if you're divorced, Jesus loves you. There is forgiveness. If you have an abortion, Jesus loves you. There is forgiveness. Okay. Birth control, sticky issue, Jesus loves you. There is forgiveness. Um, point B: This has been going on a long time. Okay. 1980s. It's like the 60s all over again in terms of sexuality, only you do see the rise of the homosexual movement getting in the public eye a little bit. Um, and you come to the day where now, one of my youth at, at high school, uh, in a conversation with a bunch of friends, has to keep their mouth shut because they're just, they just start being bigots. They start complaining about how anyone who is against homosexual marriage is an idiot and stupid and hate. Regardless of why, they just are. So she just keeps her mouth shut because they're being bigots, so she can't argue back. Um, interestingly, they're calling her a bigot while well, being a bigot, different issue. But this is kind of the thing about postmodernism. It has no problem since it's all about feeling being inconsistent in its thought. It can be as inconsistent as it wants, so long as it can say what it wants to say. So now here we are with marriage totally falling apart of the seams. Um, I got in a little bit of trouble with mom in my, uh, in my church uh, this winter because I offhandedly, I didn't use the word, but I offhandedly referenced marriage to animals. Um, as, a, as where this is going, and, and you know, it wasn't taken that well by a couple of parents, but amazingly, I'm not going to say something, but amazingly, um, yesterday, two days ago, I'm sitting there scrolling through Facebook because I waste too much time doing that, and, and a pastor um, uh, in the LCMS has posted this link to a, an article in, in Britain about this woman who just married her dog. She, she divorced her husband and married her dog. And she says, I love my dog, and the love I have for this dog is like none other I've ever had, and we just want to spend our lives together. Now, that argument should sound very familiar. It's the same argument. Right? There was a link below it to a man in Australia who was planning to marry his goat. Um, he insists that it is strictly platonic. I, I guess I can understand why he would insist that. It's not that far off. Polyamory. Marriage to multiple people. This is already here in the United States as well. This isn't stopping. So be ready for it. All of this is an example to show how much things have changed, how quickly they changed, and how none of it has been based on reason. Reason, if you look at marriage, would um, be a little more uh, eugenic in its approach. It would say, it's clear that some of our, uh, 
our, our DNA, if we pass it on, is not as strong as other DNA. And so we should, for the sake of the material world and the future of civilization, simply only pass on the good DNA and keep the bad DNA from being passed on. That's what's popular to say in the uh, uh, 1890s times. 1890s into the 1920s. Guess who made it a popular plot this way? Yeah, <laughs> you kind of ruined the judge term, but um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I say that as someone I'm not before the uh, in any way, shape, or form, but you know, Hitler took it to his logical conclusion. Yeah. Um, we're no longer looking at marriage from a logical conclusion at all. We're simply living in an age in which my feelings, my experience, my desires define what I think. So, what does this mean um, for you as a Christian in the church? What does this mean for you as a parent of a young, growing Christian, hopefully, in the church? What does this mean for Punk Rock John? What does it mean for your catechism class, where you have a tradition, a 500 year old tradition of teaching <coughs> scientific theology? The kids who are now don't even think. They feel. What does it mean? Um, I don't have easy answers to this. I'm just trying to define where we are and what we face and the cataclysmic shift in the culture that's taking place around us. I can say with certainty that a large part of the answer is rediscovering the spirituality of word and sacrament, particularly the sacrament. That the experience that I described earlier, which is anti-experience, happens in the sacrament. The faith alone moment of being a sinner in the hands of an angry God who says, I forgive you. Is it at the heart of this? The liturgy and the liturgical life of the church is at the heart of this for our kids. And by liturgy, I don't mean organ. I mean the words we say. The songs that we sing because of the words that we say. Um, all of our fight within uh, the LCMS over the worship wars is couched in this problem, in this language. Why do you mention revivals? In the 1700s, you have a movement called revivals, which scientifically looks upon, looks upon the church and says, why isn't it working? Why isn't it taking over the world like it should be? Clearly, we aren't using the right methods to convert people. And on the heels of a man named Charles Finney, who was a professed Pelagian, which means he believed that salvation was a work of man. You had to actually do it yourself, intellectually. And also believed that if you could convince a man by any means possible to accept Jesus, then he would be a Christian, and the Spirit would be at work in his life. And so he began to develop methods for better converting people. We got very good at that. Make a church in New York City. Uh, thousands of people on a Sunday. Now he talks about these methods as new measures, new tactics for how to convert people. He's really kind of biased. He's like, I can't say which ones will always be the best, but for me personally, it has been entertaining sermons and catchy tunes. Not much has changed. Yeah. Uh, well, he was doing it scientifically. Moving forward now, it's met with the new mysticism and grown exponentially then as people are seeking churches which will give them feelings all the more. Interestingly, in the middle of this, there's a whole other idea called pragmatism, which is where mysticism and rationalism meet. Pragmatism is, is the new rationalism, the new way of trying to scientifically do things, find what works, but the whole purpose of finding what works is so I can feel good. I'm going to figure out how to cook the best possible steak. Yeah, I'm, going to, I'm going to get a filet mignon. I'm going to uh, uh, get all the right spices on. I'm going to stuff it with seafood. I'm going to cook it a nice medium rare for lunch right now. But am I cooking that steak for the sake of the knowledge that I cook this steak? No, I'm cooking it for the experience of eating. So pragmatism has taken rationalism and submitted it to the mystical experience. So they, we will be thoughtful about certain things, particularly with money. Um, uh, particularly how my computer works, uh, particularly uh, uh, medical stuff, although that's dying as Eastern medicine grows. Right? Um, meanwhile, though, particularly about religion, particularly about philosophy, thought, relationships, life, everyday decisions, mysticism continues to, to remain. 
I was, I, I, that was an aside to go back. I, I needed to have that provided as me. So when we're talking about our arguments in uh, the Missouri Synod over what is appropriate worship, um, you can't even have this discussion without seeing this picture. And if you think it's an argument about what instruments we're using, you're having a different argument than most of us. Because those of us that are promoting liturgy and the vestments and the sacrament, it's, it's about this deadly motion and movement and how this is threatening and totally various. And, and if you don't think it's very this, I point you back to the fact that there are less very girls in the church than there used to be. And they're not coming back. Not, on, not just because they get married. I, I've run into them. They're not married. They have kids. They're living together. They're not coming back. That's the scary thing. Now, if your own kid is out there, you're still praying for God bless you. They might come back. Individuals might come back. The host, the grand members are not returning. The future of the church in America, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I'm pretty confident Patterns continue to look a lot smaller than it does. It brings all sorts of other problems to us. How do you support a school? I work in a school. I love my business, but I'm scared about the future. Um, how, do you, how do you pay for that building? How do you pay for a pastor's salary and his, his health care? Uh, um, your teacher's health care. All these things, all these questions are caught up in this whirlwind of thought and the death of thought and the death of words, which then has, has at its heart the devil's attempt to take what you know to be true. That Jesus Christ died and was in his coming again. You live in a sinful age which can't only die and destroy and be decadent. Let's move that to the side and have you to trust in these things again. So even as we try to answer these questions, notice that I want to come up with a reason to fix it. I want to come up with a way to make the worship meaningful for my kids. What did Paul say? I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and the crucified. This is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. So there's, there's good news in the midst of this chaos. And, and in some ways, this is good for us. It's wonderful to see just how bad it is. It's always been this bad. This will wake it up to it. Jesus is still the answer to it. He still has defeated sin, death, and the devil. He's reigning over all of it right now. Sitting on a throne, maybe, somewhere. I mean, and when I say maybe, it was the theologians argue whether he's physically in one spot or strength or whatever he's, he's sitting on a throne. He's at the right hand of God. He's controlling all things. He's moving all things. Why? He's even doing this. He's letting this happen. Why? To bring you to the last day of the faith. To drive you back to the altar so you can kneel and have the amystical, mystical experience of your sins being forgiven and you're binding to the eternal man. He's waking us up. He's doing the true revival, which only happens on the other side of repentance. And so he sends preachers like the preachers who I hope are in here today to preach. It's bad. It's falling apart. It's getting destroyed. But Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Yeah. I don't. I, I haven't given you answers today, and, and that other than Jesus, and that's on purpose. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to fix these problems where you're going to be pastors. You've got to think about catechism class and how to do what you can do for those kids. Schools, you've got to think about how you can fund yourselves and your health care in the future. We have to deal with these things. There, in those realms, though, there, there's not a silver bullet. There's not a magic answer to this. But while we walk in danger all the way, our God is with us. And he does have a silver bullet. It's his body and his blood. He does have a magic answer. It is his washing of regeneration and faith. He has said to you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So if you suffer now, if you're persecuted now, if it doesn't look like you're winning now, that's what it's supposed to look like. But I am raised for you. Cling to my word and cling to my faith until the last day. With the last eight minutes, I want to try to say everything I just said but in a more classic way. Classic way. Mm-hmm. Um, turn to Romans chapter 3. Three verse 10. I don't know if your pastors are like this, but I was, I'm always like, this is my favorite part of Scripture. We turn around, this is my favorite part of Scripture. <laughs> this, this really is one of my favorites. Um, because it, it, we see this and we're like, oh no, it's all falling apart. But that's only because we're 
maybe, maybe a bunch of Republicans. Um, <laughs> and we're way too concerned with Western civilization as if it is Christianity. It's not. And what Romans 3 tells us is that if we think it's falling apart now, we just weren't paying attention before. Because it's always falling apart. Romans 3, verse 10. None is righteous, he says. No, not one. Because there's no good person on this planet. Everybody's working with selfish motives all the time. So when you find out that your doctor prescribed for you a new drug that's just off, fresh off the market, and you read a thing in the newspaper about how this new drug is being promoted where people who prescribe it are getting cruises, it shouldn't surprise you. Huh? If you're not asking your doctor you know, why he's giving you this brand new drug, you should be. We're all evil. We're all working the angles. None of us are righteous. No, not one. Don't be surprised by it. No one understands. That is, no one has no knowledge. No one seeks for God. It is no one who is a mystic is actually seeking the true God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. That's all of us. Worthless. In ourselves. Dregs. Who? Yeah. The leftovers. No one does good, not even the one. Their throat is an open grave, Paul says. They use their tongues to deceive. That's a parallelism. Those two phrases mean the same thing. So what does it mean that our throats are open graves? That when we talk, we lie. Just think about it. How, how, much of, how many of your words on a daily basis are said to paint yourself in the best possible light? I'd be willing to bet it's close to 85% of mine. And, and, and I would say I'm probably only aware of 5% of that. And the other day, I don't even know I'm doing it, but I am. We use our tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. What does that mean? The next line, their mouths are full of curses and bitterness. One of my favorite um, pietism kind of things is how people always think that by not saying certain words, they're not cursing. And so you have all these Christian curse words, gosh dang, heck, hooey. Um, those are still curses. Why are you saying them? Because you're angry at the world? Why are you angry at the world? Because you're not God. I stubbed my toe. Why am I angry about that? Because I shouldn't have stubbed my toe. Why? Because I'm God and I should have everything I want. Now, I, don't, I don't actually think in those terms. That's what's going on. And so I love this verse. Their mouths are full of curses and bitterness because it's true. They are. I'm not this. Wish it wasn't. But it is. Their feet are swift, swift to shed blood. I was talking about your anger. How quickly you get angry. The rage that even if you hold it inside, you know it's there. You're not in the you that way. In their paths that are ruin and misery. What, what is behind us is humanity. Ruin and misery. The way of peace they haven't known. Why? Verse 18. There's no fear of God before their eyes from the leaders. Now Paul says, verse 19, we know whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. My point in all of this, he's saying, is to keep you from talking about yourself for just enough of a moment that you can hear something else. That you're being held accountable to God, and that by what you do, by your works, by your thoughts, by your emotions, no human being will be considered innocent, justified, and insight. In fact, all that you do every day can only teach you one thing. The law can only bring you one thing. Knowledge of your sin. Knowledge of you missing the mark. Verse 21, that's not the Bible. But, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ and all who believe. But, 3.10 to the end, is it 3.10 through 20 is describing who we are. Law, destruction, pain, suffering, death. Verse 21 is the shift, is the hinge, is the move from law to gospel, but Jesus. There is something different. There is a goodness from God that has been revealed apart from you, apart from what you do, apart from what you feel, apart from what you think. It is the goodness of God that is in Jesus himself, the man, the baby, born of the virgin, 2,000 years ago, in that town over in the Middle East, who walked around on those roads and did some really crazy stuff, like cast out demons and healed diseases, who he nailed to a tree because he said he was God, who before we nailed him to the tree because he said it was God, said, I'm God, nail me to something, and I'll come back to life, prove to you that I'm God. So we did it, and then he did it. There's something else in him. It's not us, but now in him, because he's man, since he's son of man, he's fused to us. 
so that the humanity, the root that is in him coming through the grave is never going to die again. And that means humanity is going to live for all eternity. So that all humans tied to his humanity instead of Adam's humanity will live for all eternity. Which is why it's so dang imperative that we tie all humans to his humanity. Which is why Christianity is about preaching Christ crucified for the forgiveness of our sins. And then getting us to the altar where his humanity is actually put in your mouth. In your stomach. And in your mouth. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God through faith, trust, restored to trusting God for all who believe. 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. That's a redundantly repetitive statement by his grace as a gift. Um, redundantly repetitive? Yeah. Grace as a gift. Uh, through the redemption, that's the buying back that is in Jesus, the atonement in Jesus. So God put forth as a propitiation. I love that word. I never used to know what propitiation meant. I didn't know until I was like 29, 30 years old. Pastor for several years. That's propitiation. I always hear it at that. It's about Jesus. It's good. But I didn't know anything else. <laughs> and I was at a, a little uh, meeting. Another pastor friend of mine um, taught me a way to remember it. I'll never forget. Because the Rolling Stones have a song about propitiation. They just don't use the word propitiation. Instead, they say, I can't get no satisfaction. No. Uh, Propitiation means satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So God put forward Jesus as a satisfaction of his wrath by his blood that you now receive by faith. To show God's righteousness, this is getting back to that wisdom Paul was talking about before, when he passes over sin and is at both, once at both the just and the justifier. He is both righteous and merciful for the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. And the ultimate wisdom of God is his mercy. His steadfast love was never faced, right? You know that from the Old Testament Psalms. So as we are here in the swirling madness of this perfect darkness, the temptation is always going to be, well, let's think out our way out of it, or well, let's feel our way out of it. The Christian answer has to be, Jesus died, Jesus rose, Jesus is coming to you. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Um, that has to be our answer. That is our answer. It's the answer of the church. And in that sense, it's a promise that we'll be here to see us through. Um, our, our test, if you want to call it that, is not to achieve anything, but to be still and know that he is behind it all. And I hope uh, today I've helped you remember that, and that if and as you read the book broken, whether once or twice, um, it helps you Learn the discernment, which sees how the devil is always trying to move this out and drives it back to the church, the congregation, where it's always being put back in. So, I say thank you, and we're going to move to questions. Um, you want to say something for your questions? Uh, just thank you. Uh -huh. And uh, We're going to try this without doing the dance. We're both on the same channel. If you have a question, I'm going to bring you the microphone. I'm hoping when I turn this on, you won't have to turn yours off. And the right. feedback will be. But if you get feedback, just flip your microphone. So questions for Pastor Fess. I will bring the microphone around. It's on. Oh, great. That's oh. In, uh, recently, there we go. Recently, I noticed that some of the uh, champions of the new atheism you mentioned earlier, uh, Dawkins, and more recently uh, Bill Nye, because of this uh, thing that he had in the um, you hear words like empirical knowledge, you hear words like um, uh, this um, oh, reasonable man, as a reasonable man, I mean, we've heard that over and over again if you, if you watch that debate. Um, and yet, at the end, he made this same plea that he did on the, on the film I did on his video, um, really going towards emotionalism. You know, if we don't, we lose this, right, right. we're you know, the country's going downhill. 
Um, I, I'm just wondering, though, if his words and, and, and Richard Dawkins' words, do you think that his words, those words like they use, like empirical and, and uh, reasonable man, is that just a throwback because they were born before 1963 or whatever you said? Or is this a shift back to rationalism? <laughs> I'm sorry, my, my laser gun went off in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question on like three different levels. I'm going to try to hit all of them. Starting with the last thing. Simply because we have moved into an age in which culture predominantly thinks with its emotions doesn't mean that science is going to go away. So just as underneath the modern age, the romantics were always there, and they were having an influence, the rationalists will always be here in the midst of the postmodern age, still having an influence. You know, it's pretty hard for someone to have something like a debate if they also insist that words don't have any meaning. The crazy thing about postmodernism is that we're so irrational that we're willing to do both of those things at the same time. And so you, I know people who, at one, on one hand, believe in millions of years as evolution, of evolution, and also believe in reincarnation. And it's kind of like, you know, where, where, you, you don't know what you're talking about. You, these things don't mesh. Yeah? What you saw in his, in his appeal to the future of our country was actually a form of rationalism. But this stuff matters because we need things to work. But pragmatism, remember, is rationalism submitted to mysticism. It doesn't have to work just because it's true, to what modernism would say. It has to work because it brings about some sort of experience which we need. Yeah. And so his appeal to that at the end um, is very much a hat tip to, to the postmodern world and the soundbite world, the sales control, selling capitalistic world. Really Finally, I think the most important thing to know about Bill Nye. Um, and, and I say this as someone who you know, liked the show, um, is that in his debate with, with Mr. Ham, he didn't really make ar arguments at all. Um, and he doesn't make arguments. He's not particularly logical. Whereas the other new atheists very much are. Now, part of the problem is that it would appear that um, Mr. Ham also is less than logical in his responses. And instead, what you have is sort of an assertions fest or a sound bites fest. Um, and assertions, as a form of argument, are the way the postmodern must argue. I don't have to make a string of logical deductions to bring you to truth. Instead, I say something's true, and hopefully it's emotionally impactful enough to convince you. I just throw it out. That's so why I say you're stupid if you believe what the Bible says. No rational man can do it. But I never bother to prove that statement. Um, and so this is kind of the key, not to um, winning over Bill or anyone else, but really to, to as you listen to these debates, these arguments, to defend their own part, say, now, did someone actually really make an argument against this, or are they simply saying that it's wrong without proof? And if we're going to have an argument about evolution or about whether Christianity is true, we certainly do want to have it in a realm in which proof is brought forward. Um, where we are going to argue based on thought and science. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not an expert on intelligent design or you know, the physics of geological history or any of these kinds of things. Um, what I, I, although I think that if you study those things, you'll find many of the arguments for evolution are far less convincing than they're purported to be, um, particularly in terms of age and things like that. Um, what I do know. Uh, is Christianity. And I do know that of all the religions in the world, there is no more provable, verifiable, factual, historical based faith than faith in the resurrection of Jesus. And the, the guy who's done the best work on this recently is a guy named Habanos. I really recommend almost all of his books. Um, uh, Did the Resurrection Happen is one in which he, he has a, it's a debate, a conversation he had with a former atheist named Anthony Flew, um, in which they talk about what we can actually factually know about the resurrection or the reported resurrection of Jesus. It's astounding uh, what honest science is willing to admit. 
problem is you, you, most of those who run into who are promoting science these days are not a lot of scientists. They're as big as, as the rest of us, ourselves included, and they skew what they're willing to, to admit as a fact based on how it will affect their argument. And so if the facts don't undermine their argument, they dismiss the fact and say it can't be true. Um, but the resurrection of Jesus as a historical event is as knowable of any kind of history that we can know short of the modern era, short of the printing press. Um, and uh, that really is something. We know other religion can say this, and then if you're going to dismiss the resurrection of Jesus, um, you have to then say we can't really know anything before 1560, and even then we probably don't know much. I mean, maybe since television we know a little more, although JFK okay, it killed him, really. You know? It's, you know, you get into this world of not knowing anything very quickly. Um, last thing I want to say about that was, oh, and so if you're going to, with that, Knowing and proving and getting the argument, argument into the death and resurrection of Jesus brings us to where, as Christians, evolution must finally be laid. It's, it's, that's the word. Um, which is, if Jesus is risen from the dead as the one who has defeated death and the devil for all history, why has he defeated death if God created the world through a series of deaths over millions of years? Or did, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, which is the text we should go to in Genesis chapter 1, Romans chapter 5, if death did indeed enter the world through Adam, how is that possible if Adam only developed out of other animals over millions of years? Well, it's not. <coughs> you can't have your, um, your eggs from your chicken and eat the wolf. Right? Don't, don't steal a lamb as long as you know something. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I'm glad you laughed because I was supposed to be stupid. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Ultimately, this, and this is where Ham, from my understanding, really missed the boat in the debate. If I was ever in a debate with an atheist, I'd just be driving to Trump's five over and over again. You, you can talk about Dave's theory, you can talk about the proof for dinosaur bones, you know, until the, the night is long, I would talk about the resurrection of Jesus and why you don't accept it so obviously true. You're going to push your trust in a bunch of guesses based on carbon dating, um, but you have countless eyewitness testimonies to the most miraculous and supernatural, substantial event in history. And you won't even bother to try to explain it, which there are three attempts at explanation. They stole the body, they all went mad, and uh, his wound. None of them pulled up to real skeptical inquiry. Um, they all have giant holes in them. So, there it is. I said there were three things. I don't know if I can recap all three of them. That was a great question, now. Let's, let's move on and see if there's other questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I just want to say, hey, guys, uh, I'm David uh, from St. Peter, Illinois, and uh, we talked a little bit on the break. I'm actually waiting for the backup setting. My little girl, Allie, said, asked me to say hi. She likes the videos. Uh, and she asked if there would be cat videos. If there would be? Yeah. Now. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we were talking about the break. Uh, I work with, in youth ministry, and I uh, wanted to know if you had any advice for youth workers on Preaching high school kids, young college kids on how to deal with some things we're talking about today, just general advice. Practically, aside from the world, we would have lost some videos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is so cool. I wish my church had All the things we're trying to do. You know, you mentioned aside from the year of the last thing, uh, video media is useful in its place. Ruby Everlasting and, and uh, Lutheran Satire are good conversation starters for youth groups. Um, they're really weak, ultimately, in teaching. Um, and this is a whole other field of science called media ecology, which has arisen since the 1970s, studying how media creates environments of thought and what media, what tools for communication are good at what things. And one of the things that's been shown pretty substantially is that mixing visual and sound media, which we would call TV or talkie vision, um, is not good for information retention. Instead, it, it gives you the impression, the feeling that you've learned something. Um, and you can say what you think you've learned about. Oh, Daddy, today I learned about butterflies. What did you learn about? Yeah, there's maybe they metamorphize. Metamorphize. What's that mean? They were caterpillars. Okay, but then you know there's some basics. But in terms of actually grinding down to the steps of metamorphosis, you're not going to retain it. 
Um, so in that way, things like move through satire, move through adolescent are great for getting the idea out. But then the place where in the classroom really um, has to happen is in the conversation and the discussion, um, uh, where the minds meet, as it were. And that way, there's nothing better to do than to study the Bible directly. Um, so you ask, you know, what, what, are, what is my advice for youth ministry? And I wish I had a, a silver bullet for you. Um, so my conscious a lot is one of the things I do at Bethany, and I never feel like it's good enough. Um, what I will say is, uh, well, I don't know, there's two directions it is. Um, one, in some ways, youth ministry is a mistake insofar as creating a subculture that teaches the kids that they don't belong in the bigger real church is deadly to them. Um, and so whatever we do with them in our Bible studies needs to be geared toward making them into full-fledged adults in the church and bringing them back to them. And that sadly, that has not been what youth ministry has done for 40 years. It's not been the philosophy or theory at all. Um, so that now, you know, the few kids that you have left at the mega church still have to have their own worship service apart from anybody else to know what they're doing. So there's that side of it. Um, the other side of it would be, um, I think, in the 80s, gimmicks worked because they were kind of new. You could do these tricks and, and um, you know, put a bunch of uh, I don't know, maple syrup and, uh, and uh, a whipped cream on someone's face and make them eat a hot dog with it, you know, and, and it was like, oh, this is clever, this is fun, because really all we have is 13 channels on the TV. And, and Nintendo, you know, rip on Nintendo, and it was fun, but it wasn't like it was that fun. Whereas today, the amount of fun that our, our kids just are having on a regular basis, the amount of entertainment they have their fingers is just mind on. Um, and so they, they, the average kid now is a little wiser to their gimmicks. And in some ways, they're going to think you're really weird if you come out and try and be cool like they are. Um, and so this is where this word authenticity is actually a really important word. It's got to be used a lot. This came out of the emerging church uh, in a lot of ways. That, that what's important to the church is authenticity, and then everyone around trying to package authenticity and sell it, uh, which is yeah, um, kind of backwards. But there's a point at which youth ministry, if we're going to keep doing it, um, has to stop trying to be something else to win the kids over and instead be who we are. Because um, that's what authenticity is. Uh, and so if I'm a Lutheran teacher, I am a teacher who believes in the power of word and sacrament, who loves the divine offices, who trusts the scriptures to be complete and, and enough to equip all of us for salvation, and then who puts my, my, um, my chips in that bag. Um, so my personal approach, and this has been developing over time, but, um, we have been on, on a diminishing the fun element of youth group strategy for a little while. Not that we refuse that fun, we're diminishing the intentional fun. Because they actually have come into those things. Um, and we're increasing uh, the amount of Bible study that we do. Uh, we stopped the Sunday morning youth event and encourage them to go to the Bible study. Not all of them do, some of them do. Some of them do with their parents, it's kind of um, The other thing I would say is, especially if you're, you know, you mentioned you're kind of new at this, um, there's a certain point at which you have to dig deeper to pull them up. And by that I mean, if you aim at the high school senior who's already gone, you're probably not going to get them back. It might. You're probably just going to seem really weird. Find a fifth grader. And get to know them. Yeah. Um, start drawing them into uh, an honest Christian man to Christian child relationship uh, with the intention of teaching them. Um, and that's where a thing like a Lutheran school, and the pastor's involvement in a Lutheran school, is just powerful, really powerful. That's why if we can keep our schools at all costs, we should try. Um, again, I, I do believe it's going to be a very hard thing to do. Um, with the grace of God, we will. Right? Um, because the, the time that I know I get with the fifth graders um, is just it pays dividends by the time you're in eighth grade, ninth grade, ninth grade. Um, so those will be my, my short answers. Um, we got to quit trying to learn how to do church from those who have a different ecclesiology than we do. Uh, the Baptists and the Methodists think differently about what Christianity is, although I will not say they are not Christians. I 
I will say uh, that what they put in the center of their Christianity is not Christian. And so letting them define for us how we teach our youth, I just can't see how that's smart. You know, in any sort of just common sense way of looking at things. I mean, would you let the Mormons teach you how to do it? Would you let the Muslims? Or would you let the Catholics? That looks actually got a better plan. They just brainwash them when they're like two. Tell them they leave the Catholic Church, you're going to hell. <laughs> right? And then they never leave. And they never go, and they never leave. So, we have another one up here. Like, like the stormtroopers, you keep missing. Well, you know. <laughs> but thanks for your talk. Uh, listening to this, maybe this is more of a comment, but also a question along the way too. As you were leading us through the history here, I put it put this way: you know, we've gone through the death of God. Mm -hmm. Through the death of man and the wars. Mm -hmm. And now we're in this latter age here, we're going through the, you know, I'm kind of thinking the death of words. Mm -hmm. This textual criticism that's kind of coming up right now, especially with the different versions of the Bible and whatnot that are sure. coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's kind of what we're fighting against. And as us as a culture, and then Christians, you said it right in the beginning, uh, it's all about word and sacrament. Mm -hmm. If we're not showing enough trust in word and sacrament, our kids and teaching them that. What are they going to do? Right. And that's really the center of this. It's all about right. right. Um, that turned off. <coughs> uh, the death of words is, is, is spot on. Um, and I mean, that is what postmodernism is. Now, replacing words, which we would understand. Word comes from the Greek idea that means meaning or thought. And we're, we're basing that with, with emotion. And if you want to know how Hitler got Germany to do what he got them to do, it's because they had already done this. His philosophy had already done that. And he was able to compel them emotional um, with his speeches and with his, uh, his promises that he made good on. I mean, life in Germany was pretty good for the Germans. Um, so th this is scary stuff. Um, you reminded me of, and you've got to go watch this if you haven't. I mentioned Lutheran satire. If you don't know Lutheran satire, uh, it is far not the best YouTube Lutheran stuff out there. <laughs> and I say that as son as a guy who has a horse in the race. Um, the most recent Lutheran satire is uh, the Gilbert and Sullivan uh, Mass, I think it's called. And it's these two gentlemen uh, dressed in Victorian style. Uh, and it's all animated. And they're having this argument about why the young people are leaving church. And their final answer is to put church into the music of the people, and so they do a Gilbert and Solomon Mass, because that's the time period. It was Pirates of Penzance, you know, you are a sinner, right? And I'm the very nature of a sinner, too. Um, uh, and it doesn't work, and they give up. But before they get there, the pastor talking to the landman, they both have uh, some ideas about maybe why, why people are leaving the church. And, and the pastor said, well, I'll start with the landman. The landman the pastor, pastor, could it be because uh, for the last you know, seven years that I've been bringing my son to church, um, all you've ever done is, you've devoted 95% of your sermons to uh, promoting the, uh, the pious obedience of the individual and our love for God, and only 5% of your sermons to preaching the death and resurrection of Jesus for the gifts of sins. And the pastor says, oh, I'm part of this. And he said, well, could that be why, uh, uh, why I'm trying to leave the church a puppy cup, puppy cup? Yes, of course, never should have mentioned it. You know, and, and they dismissed the idea. And then the pastor throws back the father, well, could it be because uh, rather than bring your children to church on a regular basis and sit with them during the divine service and sing the hymns and go home and talk about what we and raise them in what you believe and tell them what you believe, you invest in all of these other things you do together that you are passing on to them and they are surely committed to those things. Oh, completely thin plan. It can't be true. You're right. Ah, it's funny. I mean, what? I didn't think of it. You know? And they dismiss both these ideas when, in fact, this is the point of satire. Um, these are the problems going on. We have a Dartha preaching long gospel. Um, despite current movements to try to uh, get us to preach more sanctification, I'm convinced uh, that the great, the great emptiness in, in Lutheran preaching, American preaching, is the lack of the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, we have fathers who are more concerned about passing on their sports allegiances uh, than they are about uh, the faith. Um, you know, Grandpa John, the way he should go, well, the way he should go is cheering for. We're gonna, we're gonna mention enough from anybody. Um, <laughs> Truth of Pacific, right? I don't know. Um, and uh, that's what they'll do. Uh, fathers have a tremendous influence on their children, which gets us back to the youth ministry question. 
and uh, how much of, of the youth ministry as a, as a movement and a philosophy is an attempt to fix fathers not being fathers without involving fathers? Um, that's a fair question. Uh, you might want to check out his movie called Divided. Um, Ken Ham, of all people, is involved with it. And it asks some very important questions. I think you can watch it before you need to. So, death of words. As a people of the word, who was made flesh, this is a direct assault on our God, but our God's bigger. Yeah. Um, and he, as the word who was with God in the beginning, uh, and will continue to be with God unto eternity, because he is begotten and unmade. Uh, we have nothing to fear from this ultimately, um, other than our own fault, our own sinful rejection of the thing that saves. And so this becomes the task of the church, to preach that thing that saves, which is not law, but is gospel. Um, it is not you, but it is Jesus. Not that it's without the law, not that it's without you. Um, but it, also, it is the truth. He created us, he's redeemed us, and he's making us holy. How? You look for the, in the Apostles' Creed for what makes you holy. It's not during your life, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the promise of the life everlasting. Are we capturing that as who we are? That's Lutheranism. Yeah? Um, that's, that's who we are. Uh, it's too bad that that word isn't in there anymore. Maybe someday we'll. Yeah? Any other questions? I think we have like two minutes. Five minutes. Yeah? There's two of you now. I was lying. I feel like my 20-something children all have one foot in the real world and half a foot. Three quarters of them exist in the new technological virtual world. Mm -hmm. And it feels like Christ crucified is in the real world. This whole virtual world exists outside. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think that means for us in the future. Um, and then after that, we'll have one more with this gentleman, and then we'll be um, out of time. We have to be really careful that we do not mistake, uh, kind of reversing too much, mistake the medium for the message. The virtual world, which by that term is really not being used anymore, um, but the, the world of hyper-communication that these tools have created, which enable me to I didn't, I thought about it, you know, while I'm talking to you, FaceTime my wife and like, show her while I'm talking and then uh, turn it off and you wouldn't even know my dad and I'd driven to my time. But the tool that allows me to do that is a marvelous gift. It can be used for evil, like all tools. It's a marvelous gift. And what's fascinating, our timeline is gone, but it coincides with the rise of postmodern thought. You have the rise of people who are also just growing up with these tools. But many of you grew up without them, and so they're foreign. But for anybody under a certain age, they're not foreign at all. They're just the way we talk to each other. And Christ is there. His word can go wherever communication happens. It is entirely true that ultimately the church is not out, although it's out there too, but the church happens. Church is done to you in the real world. And this is what sacrament is so important. You've got to learn sacrament. That is true, um, but the, the, the changing age of communication is not necessarily the end. It is a hurdle, it's a challenge, it's a different world in which we have to learn to we'll talk like most modern a little bit. And, um, but I, I don't know that I would, I would point to that as the problem itself. Um, however, having said that, uh, there is no question in the media ecology that part of our lean into emotion is connected to the, the amount with which we trust video, video sound manipulation. And so a commercial for Kentucky Fried Chicken makes me want Kentucky Fried Chicken, even though I never go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't eat Kentucky Fried Chicken, but every time it comes out, I watch the media games and there's all these commercials recently. Oh my gosh, I am emotional, I'm driven, I'm thinking about this one down the street, right? And if the power is phenomenal. Power is phenomenal in these meetings. These meetings. Um, but, okay, so, um, I don't know if that's an answer for your concern for your kids, but I, I would hesitate to, to make the boogeyman the tools. Those tools are here, they're not going away. Um, the boogeyman is trusting the wrong things. Um, 
and uh, not having the discernment to be able to know a lie when it comes. Because uh, in the internet, in the internet world, and I can tell you, maybe not, um, maybe this room uh, isn't, isn't that, but can, can anybody who became a Lutheran through something they found on the line, that's here, raise their hand, here, one, just one, huh? Two, okay, there's two, three, yeah, not great, kind of there. Um, the, the ability to have information go to the ends of the earth like this is, is a profound thing. And what, what we're seeing is, I mean, these guys are a small sampling. There are people all over the world discovering, not Lutheranism per se, but what Lutheranism actually is, is Jesus Christ crucified for their their sins, because they're out in that virtual world hanging out in some chair, and they're angry. And they found issues, etc. Like prior Christian reader. Um, I know what Rob Wilson was doing at the church in uh, California. His various things. Um, so it's it's kind of a whole thing in reality, and you certainly can get lost in it. Uh, it's easy to let the entertainment ruin your life. And the thing about it, I, I actually have guilt over not being able to do all the fun things I want to do. So I rent video games and movies, and want to watch TV and basketball. And like, so the video game sitting there, but I pay money for it, so I feel bad that I can't play the video game because I'm watching basketball. Right? So this is the kind of stress that we have as political heads. Um, <laughs> uh, so there, there are problems. I mean, it's not like it's magical happiness. But again, I, I would hesitate to, we can't fight the media. And I don't mean the, the, the news, I mean the tools of communication. These are here. And your kids are in that street. And that's not necessarily wrong, it's where we live now. One more thing, and I'll, I'll go to the last question on that. There have been some calls by members of the church, go figure, largely from revivalism and, um, and church growthism, uh, that these new tools of communication are so wonderful and so great and so capable that we don't want to be a church at all. Because you can get all the information that you need, all the Bible teaching that you need, you can find it online. Right? And um, I've heard some, some Lutherans uh, have actually come to me and said, what you're doing is bad. Because of this very thing, people think they don't need church anymore. To which your initial comment is precisely right. Oh, yes, they do. Oh, yes, they do. And this is where, but if you're a Calvinist, actually, you don't need them. If you're a Zwingli, if you don't believe Jesus is in the bread and wine, you're right. You don't need church anymore. But if you believe Jesus is in the bread and wine, church is still where the body of Christ is. Physically, literally, for you. And hopefully, Lutheran preaching out in the new media world, whatever form it takes, radio, TV, written, whatever, has the purpose and serves the purpose of driving people to that that feast of victory uh, that is the foretaste of the feast to come. I don't know if that helps your particular issue. Um, last one. Okay. <laughs> no laser. Not so much a question, but re-saying what you said. Uh, the gentleman over here is a youth worker, and one of the best things he can tell the father of that youth or the mother is to make sure that there's family devotions in that home and with the tough schedules at least two or three times a week where they read the word and discuss it and pray together, not at bedtime, but after the supper meal. They can get together for two or three times a week. So worship, Bible study once a week, at church for sure, and then those family devotions, family devotions, family devotions, and live, live the faith, and that's pr pretty much summing up what you said, I think. <laughs> there, there are, uh, I think there can be different styles in the approach, but what you what you basically said is, is precisely right. Um, no impact will have an impact on the father talking about the faith to his kids. And whether that's reading from a devotional book, or praying the liturgy, um, or uh, sitting with them in church and after church asking about the sermon, um, that, that is what must be done if we want to be for kids. Uh, you no, know, moms can do it too. Um, sociological studies have shown fathers just have a bigger impact. Just do it. It's the way we're made. Moms, doesn't mean give up. You know, keep doing what you're doing. My wife does a lot of the heavy lifting at home. She reads the catechism during the day when I'm at work. So, you know, um, oh, I lost it. I was going to close on something again, and now uh, I lost it. Hold on, I'll see if I can get here. Um, ah, that was it. It was back to the youth thing. So one of the, the things I found um, with youth group and Bethany, this has been disappointing, of course, but 
There are so many other things that these kids are being pulled into to do. They're not bad things. Sports is a big part of it. In our area, a lot of the club sports, because they don't they can't do it during the week because they got school, are on Sunday afternoon to our youth group. Um, and so I sent out a letter recently uh, to the, uh, all the parents, and I said, I said, I understand oh. there's other stuff, and frankly, your kids don't have to come to youth group. But if they're not going to come to youth group, would you sit with them and Bible study on Sunday morning? Because you've got to do something. You've got to teach the faith to them. And I, I firmly believe that a dad sitting with the kid in Bible study on Sunday morning will have more of an impact than the youth group ever. Um, as, and I'm, you know, I'm there giving the heart to the youth um, So, yeah. The answer, though, finally, is not the law. And this is important, too. Um, the answer is the gospel. Um, and at the end of the day, we kind of have to arrest our, our hats on that. Um, Luther says that with a single prayer, you know, one German can keep all of Germany from, from falling apart. And so, Lord have mercy, has to be the way we go into everything in our future. Um, repentance is not our work, it's a work the Spirit works in us. That we are crushed before God, that we say we have nothing in mind. Um, and it's in that then that we're made alive again by Christ. So. As much as we do want to use our minds and uh, try to address these questions at the end of the day, and this maybe goes back to where you are, you just kind of have to fall on your face upon the cross and uh, say, Lord, save my children. And as a, as a father teaches my children, that's still my prayer at the end of the day. But for me, I'll bring it all to ruin. Uh, he is capable of being saved for So I really right, thank you for your time today. I'm sure you'll be able to chat with me wherever I'm sitting, um, uh, signing books for at least a few moments. And uh, those of you who made the trip, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. It was our pleasure as Saints of Salem to host all of this, to host you past with this. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate that. If, again, you want to share this with people who weren't there, it is currently on YouTube. It will be in HD quality. I will chop up the video, post it online. You can go to Salem's website. You can check it out there and share whatever you choose. That concludes the event. The book signing is in the back for you. He will be right as you exit the doors. He's in the back for the book signing. If you do not have a book, see Concordia Publishing House outside of the doors. They'll be happy to sell you a copy of Broken. The Lord be with you all and safe travels.